Okay, so I hope everybody has uh, listened to our prayer. Ngayon pong very important po ngayon yun. At uh, uh, we'll and now uh, we before we start formally the uh, the welcome remarks of our president. Of course, uh, uh, we have our uh, photo ops. Okay. Um, Engineer Milo? Yes. Yeah, can you uh, take the pictures now of our uh, attendees? Okay. okay. Okay, smile, everybody. Everyone smile. Four, three, two, one. Smile. Okay. Okay, I think I have only one page. Everyone is here. Okay, thank you very much. So, and now, uh, my dear students, of course, attendees, I would like to uh, present to you our uh, president. Of course, uh, last time, uh, nagkaroon ng problema yung uh, welcome remarks niya sa, sa recording. And of course, uh, ngayon, we make sure na nakarecord to ngayon at uh, in clear portion. So, palakpakan po natin ang ating uh, magiting na presidente ng Filipino Social Club, Mr. Erickson Reyes. Okay, hello and good afternoon everyone. Thank you, Engineer Dante Deliso, for that uh, welcome. And then I, I, I am really happy and grateful that, uh, because of your commitment and natuloy ang ating uh, webinar. And I am also grateful for the different schools, universities, groups who joined our webinar. Let me read one by one. No? I uh, would like to thank, uh, number one, uh, Madam Maria Teresa Sales Alansari from Far Eastern Private School from different branches. I would like also to thank Ms. Marjorie and Nazareth from Al Afilia Private School. I would like to thank ACSAT. Uh, there is also ASIST Bangkit Campus, Filipino Institute, NOPTI UAE, Jumeira Baccalaureate School, University of Science and Technology of Southern Philippines, Jacobs University Bremen, De La Salle College of St. Benilde, University of Makati, Bulacan State University, University of Economics and Human Sciences, Warsaw, YFC. There is also UCEM. I would like to thank GEMS, Winchester School, Dubai, GEMS Founder School, University of Essex Online, YFC, Curtin University, Emirates Aviation University, University of Nebraska High School, University of Debrecen, British University in Dubai, YFC, 3F Striders Dubai, Centris, University of the East, PUP, uh, Amity University, Al Ain School, we also have James Winchester School, Dubai. We also have DR International Private School, OCR Nation International Philippine School in Jeddah. We also have American University of Sharjah. We also have CEGP. We also have San Beda University, Filipino Computer Club, Desert Voices TM Club. So I would like to thank to all of you, to the different schools, universities, and groups who participated and survived no, for this uh, webinar that uh, we, we, we gave, we shared to the different students and youths all over the world. And sabi ko nga last time, we have a total of how many nationalities who can answer? How many nationalities that we have? Nine. Correct. So we have nine nationalities. So it's amazing. Different nationalities all over the world. We are gathered this afternoon for the second session of the webinar. And again, I would like also to encourage everyone, the students, the teachers, to continue to share, to request. No, don't hesitate to approach Philsoc, Filipino Social Club, or the Philsoc Youth Club. That uh, whatever we can assist, whatever we can help, we are here. Soon, Philsoc will visit your different schools and universities. So we will visit your uh, administrators and teachers. So to all the community members, 
And I would like also to shout out, I think uh, teacher Veronica is there, no? Shout out to teacher at sa ibang teachers na nandyan. Thank you very much for that support. Once again, welcome to our webinar. And let me leave you this uh, words, inspirational words to ponder. According to Dr. Seuss, the more that you read, the more things you will know. The more that you learn, the more places you'll go. So expected that we are now learning. So expected that uh, soon, uh, everyone, each of us, uh, will have our own different journey all over the world. Thank you very much and welcome to our second session of this webinar, Virtual Introduction to Photography. Okay, thank you very much, uh, Mr. Erickson. At of course, uh, ngayon po ay uh, bibigyan na po natin ang uh, stage kay Mr. Colin, ang ating speaker. Mr. Colin? Mr. Colin? Mr. Colin? Hello? Hello, Mr. Colin. Oh, yep. Okay, welcome. Oh my mouth, I'm bleeding. <laughs> Didn't notice. Hi, everyone. Hey. Hi. <laughs> oh, don't mind my, I didn't notice I was bleeding. Man. Okay. Okay, well, everyone, hello. Hi, this is me. I'm saying good afternoon to you all, those who are in the UAE and this region. For those of you who are around the world, of course, good morning, good evening. And to, yeah, welcome everyone. So, um, but lost. Okay, so as we begin, so I just want to make sure everyone is ready because I think today, of course, is going to be our day two. So that means that since this is a two part session, this is going to be our last day together. And I think I'm going to be taking a little bit more of your time compared to last time. And hopefully you'd strap in and uh, be ready for us to, well, um, talk about the interesting world of photography. So before we begin, I actually want to try something new in a way to make it more um, interactive with you all. So a friend of mine, I introduced this cool little website where we can um, answer some questions and things like that. So I'm going to leave it in the chat. Okay, so for those of you who are in Zoom, all right, I'm going to send a link in the chat box for a website where we can join. And accordingly, what I will do, if there's a question there for everyone to answer, all right? So it'll be here. Okay, hopefully you can see my screen. All right. So how it works is when you go, okay, for those of you who are viewing on Facebook or wherever you are, uh, you can also join in. The website is called slido.com. And over on the prompt, you will see a, there will be a prompt somewhere on the screen where there will be a code that you can enter in with this number. Uh, for those of you who are on Zoom with us, I left a link in the chat. So what you can do is when you click it, hopefully, I hope this works. Uh, this is my first time really trying it practically. When you click on the link, you will be directed to your browser. So ideally, we'd be using your phones for this. So for those of you who have another device where you can be on, okay, when you can be on, you can use your phone, I'll go to the browser or just click the link if you want to, either or would work and go to slideout.com, put the number down, and hopefully, hopefully we get to see some answers from everyone here that will pop up. I hope you guys can see my screen actually as well. Like, can you guys see what I'm showing? Hopefully you can. <laughs> hopefully, hopefully. All right. I think this is, if I click this button, all right, here we go. Cool. Okay, so now we're getting some live answers from everyone here. Well, this is really cool. Okay, so we got answers saying my macro photography, micro photography. Okay, that's a bit interesting. I have to read into that. All right. So uh, once again, I'll leave this open for a bit just to get things started for everyone so that we can grasp how many interests there are in the audience. So for those of you who are watching on Facebook, YouTube, wherever, join us as well. The, the link will be, there's no link, unfortunately for you guys, but it's already displayed on the screen at slido.com. 
put the link or sorry, put the numbers in the prompts on the website and you can join in on our, um, you can join us on our questions. So uh, it doesn't have to be just like nature or whatever. You can also be a little more specific. Maybe you want your favorite type is food. Maybe you're always on Instagram. Maybe you're always scrolling or maybe you like black and white. Maybe you like uh, lifestyle or still photography or events. I mean, events photography is kind of um, my <laughs> kind of my own like <laughs> my main line of photography. But there's others as well. There's fashion. There's portraits. There's uh, there's a whole bunch. So you can leave as many answers as you want, but hopefully you give the right one. So we won't be able to see your names, but this is just like an open question to you all. So just to briefly check out what's going on. So we got micro, we got macro, we got nature, city, animals, and sometimes sports. Wow, whoever that is, I want to see if you have your own photographs. All right, pretty cool. Architecture and landscape, amazing. That's a lot of wide shots. I hope you are, so you're not like a wide photographer if you're able to take them and you appreciate that. Cityscape. Cityscape's representation of the physical aspect of the city. I like, wow, you can even explaining that. I like that. Okay, so we got nature and nature. Okay, nature, of course, I'm also biased there. I love nature. Architecture, macro, landscape. Uh, antics and asylum. Wow, okay, that's, uh, that's, a bit, that's a bit different, okay. Antics and asylum, maybe that's like more of a uh, category in a way of what you want to be seen. Uh, that's interesting. So fine arts, you have travel. Travel, of course. I'm the man. <laughs> this is such an ideal. You can get, um, I think that's one thing we want to all do one day. You have to travel the world and to get really nice pictures and really capture, you know, beautiful creations. Okay. Classic, classic photography. Yo, I love that. I love that. I love that. We, we ended with classic. <laughs> All right. Nature scenery blur. Ooh, okay. I think I know what you're trying to say. Hopefully I do. I can show you what that means later. Uh, portrait, nature, nature, landscape, macro, family and friends. Beautiful. I like that. I really like that. I love family and friends. Selfies. <laughs> All right. All right. I like it. <laughs> Cityscape, nature, blur. Portrait, landscape, cityscape, nature, architecture, landscape, Adam. Oh, cool. Awesome, Adam. Wedding, architectural, family, portrait, nature, fashion, food, travel, headshot, photo catches everyone's eye. Wow, you guys are pretty responsive. I like that. Okay. So for those of you who are here, <laughs> pet photography, do that. Okay. Yeah. Pets are awesome as well. So for those of you who are here, actually, um, if I were to click this button, Okay, this will be our portal for the questions and answers of the entire um, session today. Okay, so whenever you guys might be having a question, hopefully uh, you can leave them here because there's going to be a tab for you all as a participant. What I can do is I can show, I can show what questions are being asked. Okay, accordingly. So whenever you might think of a question that you want to ask me, uh, leave them here. So those of you who are already answering, this is just like another tab. Okay, I just kind of try to navigate around. I don't know exactly what you all are seeing because this is what I'm seeing as a presenter. So if you ever want to ask me a question, there should be a tab alongside, okay? And I can uh, answer the questions accordingly later on. For example, Adam here, he asked me a question. How many is the max amount of filters you can put on a camera? Uh, personally, I don't know this because I haven't used that many. Okay, I would say because there's a certain point, right? You can use ND filters, you can use uh, polarizing filters, and they can all work in unison, but they all, in a way, you don't need to use so many because at some point they're all doing the same thing. You know what I mean? Okay, sure, there are some colors that changes, but you know, there are, there are certain, yeah, there are a certain number of filters you can add in to your lenses, okay? And I would say three is a good number, but I don't know the maximum. Like usually, because at some point it's just going to affect it too much and you're just gonna be. <laughs> yeah, just leave it for question and answers, Adam. Yeah, exactly. Just leave it for question and answers, all right? 
So just leave your questions here for the chats. Another thing for Zoom chat, that's where we'll be talking a little bit more. But here, we're going to be leaving all of our questions. What you can also do if a question is left over here for me to answer, you can thumbs it up. And that way I can... Is there a voice adjustment? Is it, is it all right? Hello? Are you <laughs> different than usual? What is the usual? Can you explain... Uh... Can you explain the usual to me? It's more deeper, like an auto-tune. <laughs> auto-tune? Is it different? Wait, one second. Is it different? It's different. Yeah. Really? Yeah, I've kind of noticed that too. Okay, let me check this very quickly. Okay, while we're here, I'm going to put another question for everyone to answer so that we don't waste any time let's go back here let's have one more what do i want to ask everyone uh, let me ask where would you like to go if you had a camera there we go let's launch it all right i'm gonna have a new question up while i try to figure out my microphone situation okay so the question is here and i'll leave it for a couple of minutes as i try to figure this out Uh, I'll just keep testing it actually. <laughs> maybe you can switch to your switch to your experience and maybe the bucket is yeah. then... Okay, I'll test it. Hello. One, two, I do not hear myself. That's so weird. Hmm. Yeah, no. Use your Okay, let me change my microphone then. All right, hello. As a small test, uh, I am currently using my earphones. Is this, it's gonna be a bit different for now as I'm gonna maybe change the battery of my microphone. Hopefully this is better. <laughs> if it's not, of course, it's not gonna be better. It's not exactly a microphone. Yeah, it's just, I'm gonna be using this for a while as I fix my situation, as I have my situation fixed. All right, anyway, let's get back to this. All right, so where would you like to go? Okay, I'm just gonna fix my camera real quick. Not my camera, my, my microphone. So what do we see here? We see Japan, Japan, okay, I like that. France or Spain, Paris, abandoned places. Yeah, this must be the asylum and antics person. <laughs> Maybe I'm just assuming, amazing, all right. South Korea, Korea, Japan. So we have a lot of Asians, Asian places, Philippine urban areas, beautiful place. You can really see a lot of nice things there. Manila because it has really diverse architecture. True, true, true. I've walked the streets of Manila. The Caribbean islands, aerial photography would be great. Ah, yeah, that, that would be amazing. Have that opportunity. Japan, Japan, Japan. Oh, everyone wants to go to Japan. Isn't that nice? <laughs> okay, we should we should totally go to Japan one time, guys. And Paris. So the common trend I'm seeing is a lot of France, Japan, or South Korea. Paris, all over the world with diverse cultures and traditions. That's the awesome part of traveling and being in photography. Swimming with the whales or dolphins. Wow, if you have a camera and you can do that, that's really nice. In a place where there are trees, waterfalls, and more like a forest, mountain space. Ooh, <laughs> what a dream. <laughs> yeah, space. Wedding event, nature, hiking, a lot of emotions. I like that. Lifestyle. 
travel all over the world. Every place I visit has amazing sceneries. That's great. Nice to hear. Anywhere as long as I have my camera. All right. Family reunion, meeting families again. Japan, lovely. The sea and do some diving shoots. Cool. Underwater photography is really nice. A lot of corals. You can really get a different world uh, down there. Very nice. Wood beaches. Woods beaches. So more nature. Dubai Mall for the Burj Khalifa. There we go. <laughs> I like that. Yeah, you should go to the top, guys. If you're ever in the UAE, if you're here, go to the top and get a cool view. Japan, Japan, Japan. The Colosseum and the ruins of Pompeii. Swimming with the whales and dolphins. Okay, so now let me try again. Let's go over here. What is this? It's like a DJ. <laughs> Okay, so now I'm going to try my microphone again. Hello, mic test. Is it back to this? Hello. <laughs> did this change? Did this change anything? Hopefully it did. Okay, no problem. If this is back to, if this is back to normal. Are we back to normal, friends? Yes. Classroom. Well. Sorry? Yes, four. Oh, okay. I think my I think I ended up changing my speakers too. All right. Okay. If we're back to normal, then we can officially begin with this one little icebreaker. All right. So once again, uh, before I leave this page, uh, this is where we'll leave all the questions throughout the entire session. Okay, so I'll just remove these because this is not exactly a question. Okay. And I'll leave that over there for everyone. Okay. So as we are now going to begin, all right, I will change my screen so that we can officially start. Okay, let us stop sharing. Hi. <laughs> um, let's go over here. All tab. Whoa. Close. Go over here full screen all right can everyone see my screen my screen be seen yes <laughs> right thank you can i i love the responses guys and i don't really want to keep talking alone you know talking to myself is kind of weird that's why i really want to try interacting with everyone so yeah just keep in mind the whole slido thing if you have any questions leave them there all right. Okay. So now that we are here, we're coming back. Welcome everyone once again. We're now going to be talking about photography. Okay. In even more detail. All right. So for today, what we'll be discussing this time around, no more history, no more all these things. Now we're going to get into the nitty and gritty, nitty and gritty. We're going to get into the deep stuff when it comes to exposure. So, as, so from the list here, we have exposure, the grayscale, uh, the exposure triangle. Um, we're also going to talk about what the, the stop of light means. Maybe some of you might not have heard of that yet. Uh, a little bit more detail about lenses since it was asked last time. I'm going to discuss it in a bit more detail, like what are the different types of lenses you can use and what do they um, bring into the table for everyone. So, And lastly, we're just going to cover a couple of compositional tips for hopefully all of you all to, excuse me, use in your daily photography life, whether you're a phone photographer, whether you're a film photographer, whether you're a digital photographer, in all aspects, the composition rules will generally always apply. Okay, so without further ado, let's start. Okay. Okay, so before we really move on, hopefully, uh, to those of us who are here from last week, I'll just bring a short recap of what we talked about. So last week we talked about the camera obscura, how an image is forming from light entering through a small opening. Okay, that image is reversed and upside down. Correct. I'm answering myself. I answered myself to my question. Very wonderful. Okay, so after that, we talked a little bit about history, uh, some influential people from who have affected us. So we have Aristotle, Leonardo da Vinci, what they have contributed for us. And then we talked about the negative images, how that's formed, what it is, and why is it so relevant today in film. And after that, we talked a little bit about the parts of the camera, the lens aperture shutter, shutter, 
lens aperture shutter and um what do you call viewfinder there we go i'm getting my <laughs> i'm getting my dots in check and i think the last thing i talked about is the types of cameras okay so we discussed all of that last week so this week now i mentioned that we'll be talking about exposure and it's going to be all about light all right so what is exposure everyone what is exposure <laughs> to those of you who might know the answer to this, uh, the chat is open. So Zoom chat, or you can open up your microphone if you want to. This is a question to those of you who are aware. What is exposure? The amount of light exposed in a picture. Okay. Is that Adam again? I think I recognize your voice. Oppa from yesterday. <laughs> All right. Thanks, Adam. Sorry, sir. I meant uh, last week, sir. Last week. Yeah. All right. The amount of light you let in the camera. All right. Cool. Okay. So, is there anything? Amount of light exposed to the film. Okay. I'll just wait for one more answer. <laughs> to capture the images with a determined brightness. Okay. The visibility of an image. Okay. I can see where your how that thought process came by. All right, okay. So I think everyone here has a general idea of what exposure is because it's, it's, already a, it's, an, or it's already a term that's kind of normalized, it's, you already kind of know. So to give a more like concrete understanding of what exposure is in photography specifically, exposure is the amount of light which reaches your camera sensor of film. So it's already actually answered there in chat. Uh, this is exactly what it is. Exposure deals very closely with light. Okay, I'm just gonna leave chat open on my screen so that I can just interact with you guys. Okay, all right, so this is what exposure is. Um, just to let everyone know once again, there's gonna be a lot of noteworthy types of information this time around. So not go there's not gonna be as many pictures compared to last week, there's gonna be a lot of text. So because it's gonna be a little more technical this time, have a pen and paper with you or a notebook if you're learning. This is a learning process. Photography is also about learning. We're going to be learning today. And we're going to really focus on the more technical stuff than what you should understand. All right. Something more modern. You know, nothing too, nothing about history too much this time. Okay. So as we start to move forward with our <clears throat> with our with our topics, first off, I would like to introduce a concept to you all, or not a concept, but more of a type of picture okay so a type of picture a grayscale and what a grayscale is okay so as we go to the next slide so in a grayscale image because it's more modern it's a more modern thing it's a more modern um, concept that's being used nowadays a grayscale i'll just use what's on the slide at the moment a grayscale is basically a picture or image that has all the color taken out of it Okay, so basically when you reduce the saturation all the way to zero, you can call it black and white if you want. But in more um, direct terms, when you're talking about light and exposure, you don't call it a black and white image, you would use it a grayscale because you just took away color. All right, so in a grayscale, each pixel, because we're talking about digital stuff now, and a pixel is basically a very small amount of information on your screen or wherever you're seeing it in a computer screen, LCD screen, okay, it's holding information about your images. So each of them in a grayscale represents the amount of light in an image. Now, what does that mean? You need an example, right? So this is just one example. So we have a puppy over here. And when I mean a representation of light, okay, so you can notice that there are parts of the puppy or dog, I'm not sure how old the dog is, there are parts of it where it's kind of more light, correct? It has more, it's more bright. It has more light hitting it because it's where the light is coming in. And on the opposite end, there's not much light hitting it. In fact, it's even a shadow, right? So in a grayscale, the way you can learn to appreciate images like these is now you're thinking, if you think about it from an exposure standpoint, you would start to see that light is entering from here. And now we can see that this is a way for us to understand 
where the light's coming from, what's going to be happening. Okay, so this is what a grayscale is. And this is just for everyone to follow because now this will be kind of relevant as we start to move forward. Okay, so in order for us to get the perfect exposure, whenever we are outside, indoors, or mm, wherever, <laughs> outside, indoors, that's outdoors, indoors, where else would you be? <laughs> okay, so when we're, wherever we are in every situation, in order for us to have perfect exposure, all shades of gray should be visible. So remember in the past image, okay, in this image, what I showed you over here earlier, is you need to have each shade of gray visible. When you take all the color out, you need to have each shade of gray visible. So what do I mean by that? What do I mean by each shade of gray has to be visible? What it means is you shouldn't have your exposure settings set to too bright, because when it's too bright, you will start losing the details in the lighter parts of the image and vice versa the darker, right? So that's why when we're trying to achieve perfect exposure, we need to make sure that all these shades of gray in a grayscale image is seen. Okay, so this is just one way of thinking about your images, all right? So if you ever have a, a colored image and you want to try to see if you have all of your textures, right? Make it a grayscale, take it all, take all the color out and see if you got the right exposure and you're actually seeing the brighter parts just a little bit like, you know, like the ones over here or the darker parts the ones are over here, okay? Okay, so most cameras actually have a setting within them that can calculate and set, and, well, I won't say calculate, but they can act, it can actually detect the right amount of exposure. It's somewhat a helpful feature. So mostly you would notice this and it's, it's like kind of an automatic feature. So it's basically there's a sensor, there's an exposure sensor in your camera and it's calibrated to set the exposure of your scene to be, to make sure that all of the shades will be visible in the image. Okay, so there's just a way that it's being done. And how is it being done? It's being done by something called a light meter. Okay, so a light meter is basically an apparatus or a piece of instrument that is going to be in your camera. Actually, there are also external light meters, but for the sake of today, since we're talking about cameras, we're just going to be talking about the light meter in your camera. So what is a light meter, first of all? So a light meter is a device that is used to measure the amount of light, okay? So this is the whole calibration part that I, that I just said earlier. This is what is calibrated to measure the amount of light that's coming in. This is in a way to help you make sure that you're getting the right exposure, okay? So this is what you would usually see in your digital cameras. In your digital cameras, you might see uh, this scale, okay, it's a Canon, so in Nikon, for some Nikon cameras, you will also see this. You'll have a plus to minus scale, and since it is, a, it is an apparatus or whatever you want to call it as a way of measuring light, okay, it's going to be your guide in determining if your image would either be too bright or it would be too dark, okay, too overexposed or too underexposed. Okay, so this is just an even larger representation of what it is. So you have your zero in the middle and it depends per camera, per brand. Sometimes your, your positives will be on the right, sometimes it'll be on the left. Generally, it's still the same. It is just a way to measure the amount of light. Okay, so that's what a light meter is. Okay, so how does it work? Very simply, it's just going to detect the light that's coming. There's just a small diagram. Uh, light is going to be hitting your subject and that light will be reflecting off it and then it will be hitting the camera. Okay, very simple, very simple. It just detects the amount of light coming in. Now, of course, there are other ways of thinking about this because maybe some of you who were in science class, uh, you might have noticed that whenever you wear a white t-shirt, you reflect light when you're wearing black, when you're outside, it absorbs light. Yeah, that kind of plays a role sometimes. You just have to take into account that when you're using your cameras, the light meter in your camera is detecting reflective light. So it is actually light being bounced off your subject. So if you're wearing, let's say, well, let's say if you're wearing like what I'm wearing right now, I'm wearing black, okay? If you were to put me in front of a camera, the setting would be kind of different than as if 
than with or in contrast to if I was wearing white. Okay, the reading will be different because the amount of light entering is now different. It's new because black is absorbing light. It's gonna be, it's gonna perceive it as, oh, it's less, it's still a bit darker, right? It's just a small little food for thought for everyone. It's just how light needs to work. Okay, so generally the overall light hitting the camera is average to give this position. So once the light hits your camera, what the light meter does is it tries to average everything out in order for it to reach a point where every single part of the image would be clear or seen or visible. Remember the whole grayscale thing? It's trying to achieve a point where all of those shades would be visible to the viewer, to everyone. Okay, that's the goal in photography. Usually, if you're not really trying to be artistic or when you just want to get a good photograph, your goal most of the time is to make sure you're getting the right exposure. Okay, make sure everything is seen. Okay, so this is just a bit more explanation on how it is. So once again, I just said this, your zero point, your middle point is your neutral or correct exposure. And when you start to expand, it's either going to be on the overexposed side or the underexposed side. Okay. So this is just a cool tool that you can use. Uh, usually if you have a camera, so in a digital camera or in this film camera, let's say, uh, this camera, if I'm aware, it did have, a, it does have a viewfinder. It has a viewfinder, right? But my light meter would actually be seen already in my viewfinder. So to those of you who have cameras right now, so you don't have to pick it up, don't worry. Uh, just take a mental note or write it down that when you now pick up your cameras, you will maybe now start to notice it in your viewfinders or maybe just what I showed earlier in your LCD screen. So that now that you're hopefully to those of you who didn't know what it was, now you're more aware of what it is. Okay, so basically it's like your scale of measuring how much light is coming in. You know, it's like a ruler, ruler scale, wherever parts of the world you're from, same thing. Elevator lift, street sidewalk, whatever. Okay, so how are we going to be using these two together? Okay, how are we going to use this grayscale and light meter together? If the light meter detects everything in gray and it's trying to figure out, you know, how to make sure all of it is perfect, what can you do on your part as a photographer? So, what you can do is use something called a gray card. And um, for film photographers, this was kind of their only real way of really making sure their photographs are the right exposure. Reason being is because you don't know what images were being formed in your film. You're not sure if they're gonna be well lit or not until you start to develop it and put it in a large format, right? Now for digital photographers and phone photographers and everyone out there, you can just take a picture. If it's too bright, okay, change, take it again. Is it right? Okay, no, it's not change. Take it again. Like it's a trial and error process for you. But before that was extremely difficult. You couldn't do that. So what you would be doing in place of that to try to get the right exposure, you would be using something called a gray card. So a gray card, remember before there was a calibration, right? So that calibration from before is set for all of these gray cards that are available to you. It's like a photographer accessory to have. It's, it's a good to have, you know. I personally don't use it too much, or I don't even, I don't think I have one. But generally, this is just for your information. If you want to get your exposure right almost all the time, take it, it, it will give you some time because you need to kind of shoot with it first and all. But this is just one of the ways in which you can achieve the right exposure. So what you would be doing is you would be filling so let's say I was putting my hand right in front of the camera. So the gray card would be covering the entire viewfinder, okay? And then when you're looking at your viewfinder, you're going to be setting your exposure settings. So from all of the stuff I will talk about later, so ISO, aperture, shutter speed, and all, you'll be changing that around, okay? And you should somehow reach a certain point where it should be zero, okay? The moment it reaches zero in any light setting, this is just a disclaimer, not a disclaimer, but for everyone's information, you can use a gray card in any light setting. Okay, if it's if it's your outside, if you're indoors, it will accordingly um, it will accordingly help you try to get the right exposure. Okay, it's just a tool for you to use. And just remember, your goal is to try to reach that zero point in your light meter. 
Okay. Okay. So this is just a more uh, detailed diagram of what I'm trying to say. So as you can see, your zero point is the more neutral and correct type of exposure. Your brighter side, your, the more on the brighter end, that's where it's getting a bit too bright and the highlights are just too much. And it's just a bit blown out and it's just it's too much light. But on the other end, now it's becoming a bit too dark, a bit too dull. And you're not sure if you can still you know, enjoy the image, right? The clarity is no longer there, okay? So your goal, once again, is to try to achieve the most perfect exposure as you can and try to reach the middle point, okay? Okay. So next, now we're going to be talking about the exposure triangle, okay? Okay. So, um, if, so since I just initially talked about all the grayscale stuff right now we're going to be taking a little break so i'll open it up for this q a before we start talking about exposure triangle because it's going to be kind of long so i will bring up slido again for everyone so if there is gonna be if there are gonna be any questions i'm gonna go over there okay, i'm gonna stop sharing my screen for now I'm going to go over there in Slido and we can interact over there. All right, so one second. Let me bring it up here, full screen. Go to Zoom, share screen. Okay, so we're back. We're back here on Slido.com. So just a small break for everyone before we continue. If there are any questions that you would like me to um, if you would like me to explain a little bit in more detail from what we just discussed, I'll open up for now. If you want to get a glass of water, sure. You want to go to the bathroom, go ahead. I'll just take a short break. Or if you want, you can also unmute your microphone. Why not? You want to ask me a question directly. Right. Can I get some water? The light is the light meter the same as exposure composition? Mm, what do you mean by composition exactly? Because I understand composition a bit in a different way. Bit of a different way. The same as exposure composition. You mean you mean like um trying to find out if you have the light exposure that what you're trying to say. Is the gray card still used for cameras today? Okay, so basically a gray card, I will get the closest thing I have. Okay, so a gray card, all right. So basically, whoa, a lot of things, hold on. Okay, so a gray card, just like touch up on this. Mark, check mark. So what a gray card would technically look like is it is a physical thing, okay? It is physical, so you can take it around with you. And what you would, you can still use today. Like light meters are still calibrated to use this. So what you would do is you would put this gray card to make sure the entire view is filled with this card. It's not gray, it's have something else here. But you would fill this up like your entire viewfinder would be like this would be on it and once you're there in your viewfinder or wherever you would try to set your exposure the right to the right amount by changing your settings and that's going to be an exposure triangle so i will just get that in a bit in a bit teacher soon i will do any recommendations i'm sure adam i'll i'll probably get to what you're trying to ask me later on like through the session Okay, do you have any photos that's on grayscale? I I do, but you can you can actually make these your own. So when in whatever photo editing software you might be using, just bring saturation all the way down. So just, just take it all the way down. By saturation, I mean that's dealing with colors. So whatever photo editing software you have, take it down all the way to zero or minus 100, whichever thing it's using. And that's basically what a grayscale image could be. How do you do exposure triangle? How necessary? 
it's not necessary. It, it really isn't. Like you don't have to use it all the time. The reason why I was explaining this is because this was a method for photographers before to really make sure they have their exposure right in film. Of course, that this whole thing started to become more obsolete because now you just have to take, you can just keep on experimenting, trial and error, take one picture. If it's too bright, oh well, try again, change it up. If it's too dark, try again, take it again. So a gray card is not necessary. It's just something to help you if you want to really get the, how should I say, to improve your learning process a lot better, to really understand the, the right settings to be using per situation. It's just a tool to help you, yeah? Okay, so I'll take that. Exposure triangle, I'll get to that when we're done. So if there are no more questions, once again, I'll leave this here to just keep it in mind. Slido.com, code is 62719 if you wanna leave any more questions. And I will get to all of them after this. Now let's go back. Let us go back to our, I hope, I'm, I hope this is more interactive for everyone that I'm really trying to have us all be talking while I'm going because for me personally, it's a bit uncomfortable to be talking continuously alone for two hours. All right, let's get back here. Okay, share. Here we go. Okay, so now we're gonna be talking about the exposure triangle. Okay, so this is the exposure triangle, all right? So um, to some of us who are already photographers, we know what, it, what this is, but to those of us who are just getting into it and starting our journey, the exposure triangle is basically composed of three separate things. That is your ISO, your shutter speed, and your aperture. Last week, I already talked about two of these factors, right? I talked about shutter speed and aperture, but I didn't mention ISO because ISO is very closely linked to exposure, right? And I, don't, I didn't feel like I had to talk about it last time. So in order for you to be able to get the correct exposure from your light meter, glaze scan, and everything using all of those concepts in unison, you would be changing either one of these factors, <laughs> either one of these pillars. So all of them play a role in trying to get your picture to look right, to get the right exposure, to get the perfect exposure, okay? I'll get into them into more detail, all right? So um, as an overview, this is just an overview. This is what it's going to be doing. I'll actually, you know what? I'll just show this to you all for uh, like two seconds because I'm going to explain this in even more detail shortly. Okay, so all it is is these three are actually affecting your exposure in different ways. And there are consequences for using either an extreme of either or of these factors or pillars or however you want to call them. All of these parts of the exposure triangle. Okay, so this is just an overview. I'm going to go into them in more detail later. Okay, so now I would like to explain to you all <laughs> uh, what is a stop of light, all right? So this is now what it's called or what it is. It is actually a measurement of light. So remember in the light meter, um, when we discussed about the light meter, we saw that there, were, there was a zero point, there was a plus one, there was a minus one, plus two, minus two. Right, we talked about that. So, a stop of light is basically a part of that scale. I'm gonna get to that right now. Okay, so just to understand quickly about what a stop of light is and what does it really mean when you're using this terminology in photography, a stop of light is either doubling or having the amount of light. Okay, now these values are are actually linked to the values from the exposure triangle, okay? So we talked about ISO aperture speed, aperture speed. We talked about ISO shutter speed and aperture. So the stop of light deals with the three of them, okay? So just keep it in mind, uh, each stop is doubling or having the amount of light, okay? So this is what it means. 
Okay, whenever you say that you are using a stop of life or when you want to go a stop higher or a stop lower, this is what you actually mean. So maybe you might hear a photographer because this is just a more concrete way of explaining how much light you want to achieve in your images. This is like a terminology that we use as photographers. We don't use like weird things like, can you increase the, can you increase the light? Can you increase the exposure? Can you increase the brightness? Can you increase the, all of those different words to keep it more technical for us in order for us to really understand what you're trying to say, we would be using stop of light. Okay, so this is what it is. One change in full shutter speed, one change in full f-stop number, so aperture number, uh, aperture number, or one change in ISO. And what we just talked about earlier, they are either going to be halves or doubles. Okay, that is how we're going to get into this, okay? Okay, so in photography, this not these numbers, these are going to be the concrete numbers that you are going to almost always be using to base off your shots, okay? Now, I'm, of course, I'm talking about digital photography and sometimes film, you can also be using this, but this is just for those who are now using manual mode. I know there are some phones out there that let you have this, so this is just for you to uh, keep in mind. Okay, so these are your standard full stop numbers. Okay, so you can see that there is more light and less light. Accordingly, you are either doubling or having your amount of light per each number. For example, if, you're, if your current setting is 200, if you're saying you want to go a stop higher, you would be doubling the amount of light. So that means you are going to be going to 400, okay? Now, vice versa, if you're going to say, I want to go a stop of light lower, I would half my amount of light and I would be getting 100. Okay, I know there's some math, some math, we have to use some math here in photography as well. You know, math is relevant, guys. There are, I know there are so many jokes that we're always saying, like, why are we ever gonna be using math? Math is everywhere, you can never escape it. Okay, so this is just what it is. A stop of light is doubling or having the amount of light, okay? So in a light meter reading, this is the representation of what is happening, okay? So for this, your aperture number remains the same, okay? And when you're using your light meters, we are changing the shutter speed in this case. So for this one, what we did is we increased our shutter speed by double the amount, okay? Now, because we increased our shutter speed, we allowed less light in. So that meant that we half the amount of light entering into the camera in terms of shutter speed, correct? So that's why it went to the minus side of the light meter, okay? So vice versa, when we expose our sensor longer, all right, 1 60th of a second is slower than 1 25th. We technically doubled the amount of light entering our cameras. Okay, I, hope, I hope this is um, more easy to follow now. So just remember the whole rule of adjusting your settings now is about getting it in doubles or in halves, okay? This is how, this is how we should be thinking about adjusting our exposures as photographers. Okay, instead of randomly changing our numbers, trying to get the right thing, try to think of it in this way of doubling or having the amount of light using the numbers that you already know. Okay, so once again, this is your normal exposure. Okay, this is the goal for everyone. Um, oh, I forgot I slid this in in between. I should have put this in the end of, uh, in the, end of the stop of light one. But once again, right, our goal is to have the perfect exposure. So these are just some quick tips, quick tips for you to always remember trying to achieve it. So you should be always aware that your goal is to try to make sure all the shades of gray is seen. Pay special attention to how your highlights and shadows are going to look like. And generally in photography, it is very easy to blow out your highlights. Okay, by blowout, I mean you are 
more often than not going to find yourself overexposing. This is gonna more often than not you will find yourself having your settings set a bit too high, as compared to it being a bit too low. Okay, this is this is generally the case almost all the time. Okay, and it is very easy to get it to a point where you are losing details in your highlights. Okay. Okay, maybe some of you are writing it down. If you guys are writing it down, then I'll just leave it on for a bit so that y'all can follow with me. I forgot that, yeah, I told you guys to write. So I'll try to slow down a bit, hopefully, for everyone to be able to catch up if you guys are writing with me. So if you guys wrote this down, then I'm just going to move on in five, four, three, two, one. All right. Okay, so next is a, a more representation or more representations of what is happening when you are going uh, steps up. So you're doubling the amount of light. So this is just in this case, because there are so many factors that have to play into light, to the stop of light changing. So what ends up happening here is now there are two things being played around with that is achieving a higher stop. Previously, we only talked about one thing staying constant, but another thing changing. But that won't strictly always be the case. It's not always going to be like that for you. It's going to change. Maybe you need to change two of these settings. Maybe you need to change three of them. It all depends on the situation. But this is just what's going to be happening. So when you are overexposing, when you find yourself a bit overexposed and your light meter reading is you know, going on the plus side, this is how it should kind of look like. Okay, it's now getting too bright. Okay, you're, you're going, you're, you're basically doubling or quadrupling the amount of light of the normal exposure. So likewise, if you're underexposed and you're using your light meter to help you, you, sometimes you might find yourself a bit too far off and maybe you need to either double or quadruple the amount of light you're getting in. Okay, so basically what I told every, what I told you all is this is just a way for you to adjust your settings in a way where you really know what do these numbers mean. Each change is either half a stop or a full stop more or less than the previous. Okay, this is what's happening with light. Just to keep a mental, just keep a mental note of it so that now hopefully with this knowledge, you wouldn't be using random numbers every single time anymore. Wherever setting you are in, maybe if you're using a digital camera, take a picture. Okay, if it's too dark or too bright, start to play around by either doubling or having your settings. Cool. <laughs> cool. Okay. So there's just one concept that I'll cover very quickly, and this is bracketing. Um, it, you would mostly see this in digital cameras. And what bracketing is basically, it's just a way to I'll go to the next slide, actually. It's just a way to take several shots of the same scene with different exposure settings. So what it is, because we already explained what stops were, it basically takes a set of three or five images with one stop differences between them. I'll repeat that. You will be taking pictures, okay? Or what the camera will be doing, it will be taking pictures. Okay, I see something in chat. It'll be taking pictures. It's okay, you don't need a camera. You'll be taking pictures, and what it will, what it will do is it will take it in a series where you will have your middle, so your perfect exposure. You will have another picture that will be taken automatically. The camera will do it. A stop lower and a stop higher. And this is just for your information. There are cameras that are capable of doing this. There are cameras that are not. It's not important. Don't, don't worry. It's not exactly the most important thing in the world. There's just some, uh, this is just a way for you to really, if you really want to understand what stops are and how they look like per image, this is your way of doing it. Bracketing. Uh, I recommend looking it up if you're really interested in, in finding out what it does and how to fully get a grasp of what fully get a grasp of what stops of light are. Okay. So this is just a representation of what is going to be happening. Okay. So in bracketing, if you're going to set it to take five shots, okay, 
your first shot, usually it depends per camera, but what it will try to do is it will automatically set all of your shots to be one stop different from each other. Okay. So for example, this is your normal exposure. Okay, this is your zero reading. Okay. And when you're using the bracketing setting in your cameras, it will take more pictures once again of it going stop slower and stops higher. Okay, this is just for your information. You don't have to use this. This is just for you to, if you really want to grasp how it looks like and what settings are changing, you can take note. It's part of the learning process. Personally, I used this at some point when I was really interested in what light was. Uh, one practical way of using this is for high dynamic range. So those images where it seems so weird that every single part is light up correctly, uh, somehow all the shadows are not really shadows, all the highlights are not really highlights and everything is lit up correctly. I can show you an example later of a high dynamic range image, but that's usually the application of bracketing, like why you would ever use bracketing in the first place. High dynamic range now. It's, 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 not a, it's not a need to know basis. Don't worry too much. We'll move on. Okay. So if there are any questions, <laughs> leave them on Slido and um, I'll get to them. Actually, you know what? Why don't I open it up again? You know, because I really want to interact with the chat with the chat. I want to interact with the chat and everyone. So I'm going to open up Slido again for a couple more questions. Once again, a, sh a small short break for maybe five minutes for you to gather your thoughts. And I'll open up Slido. Once again, just leave it there because I'll, I'll try to answer it to the best of my ability here. So let's go over here. Uh, full screen that. Alt tab, share screen. Here we go. Okay. We're back here. We are back here, friends, on Slido. What's up? How do you do an exposure triangle? Okay, I'll, I'll get to that. I'll actually get to that in the session. How do you do that effect, like change the light focus on an object? I will get to that as well later on when I talk about aperture shortly you know you're pretty excited man <laughs> i love that i love that adam really excited i will get to that i will get to what to how that works in in oh in a bit okay what is auto bracketing okay so this is just what i explained earlier right so what auto bracketing is it's i just you, if you remove the auto part it's the same thing uh, what bracketing is. Bracketing is when you <clears throat> is when your camera is set to take pictures that are one stop lower or one stop higher per the image respectively. Like per the image where if you were having the exposure at the zero point, plus minus accordingly. Okay, the auto part is it doing it automatically so but i already explained what bracketing is okay okay so night vision cameras exceed more than two plus aperture to show images at night yeah you can you can think of it that way but another way that you can think about it instead of using plus two aperture uh, in another way is you can start to think of it like stops of light so yes you have the right idea in mind when you're when you're um, at when you're outside at night, you need more light to enter your cameras, right? And in order for that to happen, you need to play around with your settings. So what you said was correct. You need to use higher stops of light. That means you need to use a greater um, exposure setting so that things are coming in. So what you have, what what you thought about was correct. You would use uh, lower. You would use lower aperture numbers. So that would mean you are using more stops of aperture. So you got it right, plus two. I like that, man. Good job, Adam, you understood it the right way. Yes, that's correct. You're doing it right. When would you use bracketing? Okay, so I just um, 
to reiterate that again, you would use bracketing by practically, you would be using them when you're trying to capture high dynamic range images. It is when your images are merged together. So remember when I said you are taking three images? For example, I'm taking three images. So my normal exposure, my underexposed and my overexposed, right? So the differences between them is when you are, <laughs> the differences between them, when you are going lower, you are technically trying to get your sky to look more detailed because usually the sky is just way too bright. That's for the sun. So let's say you're taking a picture of an outdoor pic of an outdoor scene. When you're underexposing, you're trying to get details in the sky, right? That's what, that's what it is. You're trying to make sure the details are still seen, that the shades of gray is more visible. Likewise, when you overexpose, okay, you are getting more details in the darker and shadowy parts of the image. So in post-production, basically when you're editing, when you merge all of those pictures together and their exposures, you would be getting the rightly exposed sky. You would be getting the rightly, rightly, rightly? rightly, rightly exposed um, darker parts of the image all together in one. So technically it's not natural because that's not how it looks like. It doesn't, and not everything is gonna be bright all the time. There will always be shadows. And this is just one way of showing, maybe you're looking at architecture, but that's usually when you would be using bracketing or you're taking a nature landscape photograph. That's when you would also use bracketing because now you're making those dynamic ranges and stuff like that stuff like that okay so hopefully that, that answers your question how to remove shakiness in an action shot i'll get to that is it necessary to have lower iso i'll get to that okay so now i think we have all of our bracketing questions answered so i will get to all of these right now okay right now when we go back to our presentation <laughs> all right well, thanks for interacting guys i, I really do feel like y'all are with me in this and we are um, learning new things together along the way okay so now we are going to be talking about i s o all right so just to revisit the exposure triangle once again okay so uh your three pillars, ISO, shutter speed, and aperture. They're all going to be playing a role. So now I will go into deeper detail of what ISO does. Okay, why is it important? Does it really play a role in allowing light in? <laughs> okay, so the ISO number, before when we're talking about film, the ISO number indicates how sensitive a film is to light, okay? So when you're talking about ISO, you are dealing with the sensitivity of your camera. This is just an easier way to understand because it, it gets a bit more complicated later on, but to have, to give you all an idea, it is the sensitivity, okay? When we're talking about ISO, we're talking about sensitivity, okay? Specifically, we're going to be talking about film, all right? So, uh, as an example, I have one here too, actually. I have Fujifilm with me, but this is a picture, right? So I have Fujifilm with me here. Hello, this is my roll of film, right? So your ISO number would be seen in very big numbers in your rolls of film, right? Because it is an indication, right? It is an indication of how sensitive your film is, all right? I'm just going to take a sip of water. Ah, okay. So the reason why ISO num the ISO number is relevant and what it means when you are increasing or decreasing it, what it meant in film before is it is a determinant factor of how fast, how fast your film would be exposing Okay, former right sentence, Colin. It is how fast your film would be exposed. 
I said it correctly. Yes. So what it is, is when you're using a larger ISO number, okay, when you're going higher, when you're using higher ISO numbers, you are telling your film that you want it to expose quickly. You want it to detect light much faster. You want an image to form much faster. All right. That's what ISO is in film. Okay. <laughs> All right. So this is what it is. So you usually call it film speed before. It wasn't really called ISO. It wasn't really a normal thing. Your term for it before is called film speed. But the idea transcended, transcended. The idea progressed in digital in the digital form, but now it's dealing more so with the sensitivity. Okay, so the ISO numbers now, because we're going into the modern age, it is now ranging from extreme. So you, you can be down, you can go all the way down to 10 or maybe hundreds, and you can even go up to the 10,000s. All right, so for as an example, one second, what is happening? Okay, so this is just a an overview of what are the numbers you're going to be seeing in your cameras right so sometimes you will be seeing it in full stops okay remember i, I said that before your full stops are 100 200 400 800 1600 3200 right and if you're going to really want to get precise iso numbers they will be in third stops okay that's dividing it by three Okay, so these are just numbers that you'll generally know. It can go really high or it can go really low. And to still reiterate, the ISO, okay, it deals with the sensitivity of your cameras. Okay, hopefully you're still remembering that. All right, so the change to digital, okay, according to my presentation, the change to digital removed the difficulty of being stuck in one ISO setting for a full roll of film. Okay, so what does this mean? This means that now we have the full control of how sensitive we want our cameras to be. So be it in phone, be it in like digital DSLRs, in point and shoot cameras, the ISO is now variable and you can change it. But before, you're kind of stuck with it, right? You're kind of stuck. Right? You're kind of stuck with this for your, your whole uh, for this one, it's 36, if I'm not mistaken. So for 36 shots, I am stuck with ISO 400 and I cannot change it, right? That was my issue. But now everything is easier. Now we can change our ISO settings based on what we want to do, okay? Cool. So hopefully you guys understand how the digital change now makes it so much easier for us, okay? So... As we move on, we're going to be talking about sensitivity. So sensitivity in digital terms is based on how quickly your camera sensor reacts. So I just talked about this, right? How sensitive your camera is going to be detecting that light that is, you're allowing to enter. Okay. So there is a consequence. Okay. So you can always, so you can give me a question and say, if you're using a good sensor that can always detect all the amounts of light in every single situation why don't you just use a higher iso well this is the case this is what happens when you use a higher iso what happens is you're going to be introducing something called grain or in other words noise okay so as a comparison i got this image from google <laughs> google help me google helps guys so uh on the left side, this is just a representation, ISO 100 was used. On the right side, ISO 3200 was used. Okay, and there's a difference, right? You're introducing more noise and it's, it's just not going to look right. You know, it's like, where is, I don't like this image anymore because it looks, yeah, just, you know. It's, so that is the consequence of using higher ISO numbers. You are introducing something called noise and grain. So what is noise and grain? I'll get to that in a second. So just another example. Uh, this is when your lenses are covered, right? So generally in your normal ISO setting, maybe 200, this is how it would look like crystal clear. When you're trying to brighten up an extremely dark image using your ISO, because there's no light entering, you cannot change shutter speed anymore. You cannot change aperture, there's no light. If you're only using your ISO alone to adjust your exposure, 
this is the extreme of what would happen. The full extreme. It's going to look very fuzzy. It's really not going to look right. It's just, it's just, no, you know, like, you don't want this to happen. It's just not right. Right? Just, just don't do it. You know? This is, don't try. Don't use very high ISO numbers if you're, if it's not, if it's not your goal. You know, if you just, just want to try it, sure, but don't do it. Okay. So to give you, um, it into more words, high ISO numbers will start to lower the quality of your image. Okay. And it introduces more noise in the picture. Okay. So. If you're still not quite exactly grasping what noise is, okay, if if it's still not clear, because I know it's it's something new, since how how can how can noise if we the way we like no noise, how is it really entering a camera? It's not light, right? That's not light. <laughs> That's not light. Hold on. I'm seeing stuff in the chat here. Kind of looks like old TV noise. Yeah, bro. Okay. Yeah, so I would rather have everyone understand it in ways of audio noise. So if in order for you to just grasp what noise really is in photography. So for example, let's say you are outside and you are with your friend or whoever you're going to be with. I don't know. You're talking to someone and you're outside. Let's say you're in a park. So in a park, it's very quiet, right? It's quiet generally. I won't say it's always quiet. Generally, you will find a quiet place there where you can talk with your friend and have a good conversation, okay? You will be hearing your friend very clearly. They don't have to raise their voice. You don't need to really atone your ears in such a way where you need to listen to their speech patterns. Like, in, you need to focus for that. You can just relax and just listen to them, right? Now, on the opposite end, in contrast, let's say you're in a busy street and your setting is still the same. You're trying to talk to your friend, but now so many things are happening. You're hearing cars honking. You're hearing planes fly by. You're hearing other people's conversation. You're hearing phones ring. You're hearing hot dogs churning. This is New York City, so I'm going to say hot dogs. Like, you're going to be hearing so many things, and there's just so much noise. It's just so much disturbance, right? It's just way too much, right? So imagine that in the same way when you are taking photographs, when you're using a higher ISO numbers, you are in a way making your ears more sensitive to audio noise, right? Like at some point it's just too much. Like you really just can't hear what your friend is trying to say. It's just all oh, it's, it's, it's too disturbing, right? It's just too, it's not ideal, right? So likewise in photography, when you're using your ISO, this is what's happening. You do not want your images to look super grainy and super noisy because it's detecting all of these different, um, these different, what's the word? These different differences? No. Okay, basically it's just nothing. It's just something that you don't want it to detect. All right, I'll try to, I'll think of the word later. Okay, so once again, the noise, reduces the overall sharpness and clarity of the picture. Okay, so just another example here for everyone. I'll skip through that. Another example, there's just too much noise coming in. If you want to know how noise is formed, okay, I think I should mention this. Okay, so the way that noise forms in a camera is that because light and the way it travels is very random, right? because of its randomness and volatility, when you're using a more sensitive type of film or sensor, in this case, if you're digitally, if you're talking about digital terms, when you're using a more sensitive film, okay, when light is reaching your, when light is reaching, just take out the camera again, when light is reaching your sensor or film, okay, through your lens and everything, it's coming in through here, at, when you're exposing it, there is a chance for that light to hit something and bounce. There's a chance. It's, it's random. It's variable. It might, it might happen. It might not. But the amount of time you're allowing that to happen depends, 
okay so this is why high and this is why noise and grain can come into your images through long exposure times as well the reason why is because light is hitting certain parts of your sensor or film that you don't want it to hit you're allowing it to happen why are you allowing it to happen it's because you're making it more sensitive or you're allowing just way too much light in and you're giving that margin there we go that's the word i'm looking for you're looking for that you're adding a margin of error okay it's like you're making it more slippery if for example you're on the floor you're giving it more margins of error like the chance of something going wrong is higher when you're using more sensitive numbers or you're exposing your sensor or film longer all right so hopefully you can you can grasp that this is what's going to be happening when you're using high, higher ISO numbers okay okay so um, most of the time when you when you will start uh, noticing so much noise is when you are in night photography. So Adam just said it before. I think it was Adam, or I'm not sure when he talked about ISO. Yeah, he talked about aperture, right? But even in ISO plays a role when you're trying to expose for nighttime. And when you're trying to expose for nighttime, you're trying to expose your images correctly. And unfortunately, you need to introduce more grain into your image because you need to light things up, correct? You want to light things up. You want things to be clear. And because that is your goal, you might need to you might need to increase your ISO numbers. Okay, so it's just a give and take. Most of the time, it's always going to come down to a give and take experience. Okay, so since we are concluding everything about ISO, I'll just leave you with some quick tips over here. So some quick tips about ISO is for us as photographers we need to try to use the lowest possible iso number for our situation in order to preserve the image quality all right so you already saw from the examples earlier of what is happening if we use higher iso numbers right so our goal whenever we're faced with choosing our iso use the lowest possible like the lowest possible this is just generally because I know there's the artistic side of adding grain and adding noise. Okay, fine, sure. If you're that type of photographer, great. Use it however you want to use it. But for general use, for the general public, for you and me, generally use the lowest ISO number you can. Okay, and for me, because it's already been commercialized and everything, okay, 400. ISO 400 is your best starting point wherever you are. Okay, if you're indoors or outdoors, start off with ISO 400 when you are using manual mode. Okay, okay, cool. Let's move on. <laughs> okay, hopefully that wasn't too long. <laughs> uh, hopefully you guys grasp what ISO is. So once again, just to recap before I talk about shutter speed, ISO. It's all about the sensitivity of your camera, okay? If you use higher ISO numbers, you'll start to introduce noise and grain, okay? And of course, it plays a role in how bright or how dark your images will be, all right? Cool. Now, you can take a short pause if you want to, um, <laughs> if you want to, let's take a short pause. I wanna take a drink of water, so I'll pause for like two minutes. Real quick. Oh yeah, I forgot. Actually, time check. So we started around three thirty, if I'm not mistaken, or four o'clock. I'm not so sure. Three <laughs> thirty. Three thirty. Okay, thank you. So we so we've been together for an hour and a half. Um. I hope I am not boring you guys. I know this is just a lot of information and we are technically learning. So hopefully you guys can still bear with me just a little bit more, a little bit more. We're getting very close to the end. At this point, I can say we're at the halfway point. Okay, we're at the halfway point or maybe 60% in. We're getting there, all right? Because there's just a lot of information about exposure, okay?
you're on time. All right, cool. Okay, let's drink some more. Oh yeah, guys, I love drinking water. You guys should drink water too. You know, water is great. Okay, so let's move on. <laughs> let's move on. So now we'll talk about shutter speed in more detail. Okay. All right. So last week, uh, to those of you who were there, and to those of you who are just joining us now, last week we discussed what you could do with your shutter speed and what it means. Okay. It's how it's this thing that moves up and down and and allows how much light you want to enter into your picture, right? That's what's happening in your shutter speed. So this is just a couple of numbers that you'll come across for your shutter speeds. Okay, so now we're dealing with speed, so seconds. So over here, as you can see, we have, I think this is a double apostrophe if I'm not mistaken. So for a double apostrophe, when you see that, that already means seconds okay so you will usually see this in cameras in digital cameras where you're setting your shutter speeds and you go a bit to, to the opposite end and you're wondering why is it one two a double apostrophes or apostrophes this is what it is okay when you're going to one or two double apostrophes those are seconds all right and vice versa when you're going downwards now you're using half a second a quarter of a second an eighth of a second fifteenth of a second 30th of a second, 160th of a second, and it goes on. I won't go to every single number, but this is what shutter speeds are in their numbers. Okay. Okay. Here's some more channel. <laughs> Wait, did you guys really hear me drink? That's funny. Okay. So remember um, from last week, <laughs> from last week, we talked about some effects that we could achieve. All right. Some effects that we can achieve when we are out and about and we want to use some cool things with our shutter speed right what we can do just to recap once again we can either freeze motion or show motion so i think adam asked this question again mr really participant i love his participation all the time uh, adam asked something about those earthquakes and all yeah so the concept of trying to get an image when your earthquake is happening is this you can freeze motion or show motion using your shutter speed, okay? Now the consequence, that's what, what I'm basically saying, these are the consequences of using different shutter speed numbers, all right? You can either show motion or freeze motion. Previously in ISO, it's all about when you're going higher, more grain, more noise, and it's bad. But this one, you can play around and really achieve unique pictures and images in your photography journey okay so for example what you can achieve if you are outside and you want to show motion you can get pictures like these okay like trailing lights okay this is what it's called it's a trailing light image now i think this is pretty cool okay i think this is pretty cool because now you can really visualize how light is moving in in a shot okay so you can also use this in an amusement park Maybe you have a Ferris wheel, or maybe you have a flashlight, like what you can do, you can set your camera up for a longer expose, exposure time and then draw using a flashlight. You can draw your name, you can do whatever you want. You can have some fun because photography is fun, guys. You can really experiment and do a bunch of things. So this is just one of the things you can do. You can achieve trading lights. So how you would be doing this is, you would set your exposure time to around one second or more, depending on how fast or how slow the light is moving, okay? So maybe you're trying to get a picture of a highway. So that means cars are moving pretty quickly, like maybe, what, 60 kilometers an hour or something? No, a highway would be around 100 kilometers an hour, more or less. So we'd be using numbers around one upon 60, maybe, maybe one upon 30, or at most you can even do one second, right? If you really wanna show this, okay? So this is when you're allowing more light to enter your sensors, okay? So this is just some of the things that you can do, okay? This is another thing you can also do. If you really wanna show motion and add that artistic element or you know, the artistic side into your image, this is what you can also do. So this is called a panning shot. So what it is, 
is you're basically following your subject, all right? You're basically following your subject when you're trying to capture them at the same speed they are moving, okay? And because you are using a somewhat slower, slower shutter speed, that's correct? Because you're using a somewhat slower shutter speed, you can, while you're moving, since you are following your subject, that subject will still be still when you click, but everything else will be shifting, right? It will be moving, right? Kind of cool if you think about it. This is just a way to show movement, that something is moving. So maybe you want to have a person running instead. Maybe you want to have a car. You can try this on your own time. So this is just a way that you can try it. You can go outside right now. Okay, let's go outside right now if you have your cameras. But um, what you can do, maybe whenever you're out and about with your camera, you want to try a panning shot, just play around with these settings first with your shutter speed. Okay, so try to use maybe one upon 30, one upon 60, somewhere there. Okay. As long as it's slow enough that you capture the blur of those of the background when you're moving, right? When you are moving, okay, wherever you are, the goal of this is you are following your subject, okay? You're following your subject and how fast they are going, and you want to show the motion of the background moving, right? Just like this, okay? Basically, what the photographer was doing, he was following this vehicle and this guy driving it very quickly. And because he was using a slower shutter speed, everything just was shifting. Okay, so once again, if for me to answer Adam's question, if you want to remove shake in this in that type of situation, use a faster shutter speed. Okay, if you want to freeze it, go faster. You know, just like this. Maybe this is an earthquake situation. No, <laughs> I'm just kidding. But the opposite end of what you can do when you're using faster shutter speeds is you can freeze motion. So in practical use, you can use it to freeze water. You can use it in sports photography. You can use it in race, you know, okay, racing, like all of these situations where there's so much movement. And if your goal is to freeze something, use a faster shutter speed, right? So generally, yeah, when you're shooting out, when you're trying to do events and there's a lot of moving parts and people are going around everywhere, and you want to freeze motion, use a fast shutter speed. Okay, so I know, and now we already talked about it last week, so it's just like a kind of a recap of what are the things you can do. Okay, now for quick tips as an everyday photographer, okay, if you are out and about and you're taking pictures, it is a it is something to remember that you want to remove your element of movement in a camera okay you want to remove that because you don't want to introduce a motion blur because your arms are shaking because you're just so unstable you don't want to do that why because maybe that might not be your intention okay and the camera shake that you are having is not going to look natural for your excuse me for your um for your subject Okay, maybe your person is running towards there, but you're you shook the other way, so it just looks really weird, right? So, a general tip: what you should keep in mind is how stable you are when you are handling your camera. So try to lean against the wall, uh, go towards the side, just like this girl. Be on a table, wherever place that you can have your camera the steadiest as possible. Use it because in that way you are removing margins of error. I love that sentence now, margin of error. You're removing the margin of error. Wow. <laughs> okay, so yeah, so try to um, try to make yourself as steady as possible so that you are not introducing motion blur from yourself, okay? Even use a tripod if you want. That's your goal, like, okay, set one up, that will take time, but try to remove it, okay? So, Depends on personal preference, all right? Uh, personally, I like this number very much. Um, around 1, 125 is the number that you can start using when you want to remove the element of camera shake, okay? So this is just general, just generally, maybe you're just an everyday shooting still life or whatever, or whatever it is, a good starting point would be one upon one to five because at this number your general shake 
no matter how steady you are, hopefully you're being as steady as you can be, it won't be detected by your camera. Okay, so a good number to start off with, right? One upon 125, okay? Okay. <laughs> I hope you're still bearing with me as we're still going to push through. We'll take a Q&A break after I talk about aperture, right? We'll take it shortly and then you guys can stand up and stretch because I want to stand up and stretch as well. So we're just going to push for this and we're going to take maybe a five to 10 minute break. All right. Okay. So lastly, in our exposure triangle, lastly, we're going to be talking about the aperture. Okay. And all about changing focus and, and, how you can use a new concept called depth of field. I called it depth of sharpness last week because that's easier to understand. Now I will be using depth of field and how the aperture plays a role in this. Okay, what it does, what it means, what does it mean to use bigger holes or smaller holes? We'll get to that, okay? So um, just like from last week, we already talked about that the aperture number deals with the brightness okay i won't go into this i won't go into details of this anymore okay we're going to be talking about something more important and that is the depth of field and what it is okay so the depth of field i need to really visually show you this the depth of field is basically the range of items that will be in focus on your image Okay, it's the range or the distance of items that is going to be in focus in your image. Or if you don't want to use in focus, it is the range of items that will be sharp in your images. Okay, so to explain how that looks like, when I am using a larger lens opening, I would be having a shallower or smaller depth of field okay what that means is only a specific part of the image will be sharp only a specific part of the image will be in focus all right and everything else will be blurred out okay so this will be blurry that will be blurry background blurry this blurry it'll be blurry okay i think the effect is called bokeh if i'm not mistaken Okay, this effect of blurriness and all, the way to achieve that is to start using larger lens openings or lower f-stop numbers. So vice versa, when you are using smaller opening, you are increasing, <laughs> you are increasing your depth of field, okay? That means the range of items or elements in your image will be more in focus it will be sharper all right so as you can see the foreground or the apples in the foreground is more in focus and even the leaves in the background it's more in focus on this image as compared to the one on the left side right Hope you all are following me. <laughs> but yeah this is what depth of field is visually okay so the way it works in terms of the camera so let's say your image or let's say your subject is 1.8 meters away your depth of field when you're using a smaller aperture number or larger opening would be between 1.7 to 2 away so that means you are getting only that part in focus but if you're using a smaller opening okay you're increasing that distance between each other you're allowing more things to be in focus Okay, now hopefully this is somewhat clear enough. I will clear it up when we'll have our Q&A session in a bit, but this is generally what is happening in depth of field, the depth of sharpness, what is going to be seen, okay? This is just a more visual representation, okay? So just remember that there are consequences. So if you're trying to get a lot of things in focus in your image, the consequence of that is you're allowing less light in, okay? That is what's going to end up happening. So you really need to find your middle ground. You need to sacrifice something from one of those factors in the 
exposure triangle in order for you to reach the desired depth of field you want for your image. So now you can start to see why all of these things really depend on each other, because maybe you might want a shallow depth of field. Maybe you just want to expose the face of someone and you want their background to be, let's say a portrait. Yeah, you want their face to be in focus, but you want their background to be out of focus. But because you're doing that, you're making your image very bright because you're using a large opening. Correct. So you need to start playing around with your shutter speed and ISO accordingly. Right. Right. So just remember that there are consequences whenever you're changing settings, especially in aperture. When you're using a smaller opening, you're allowing less light in, but you are allowing more elements in your image to be in focus, to be sharp. Okay, cool. All right. So this is just another representation. This is just another way to look at it. So let's say you put a, stack, a set of cards on a table like this. Okay, so my focus point or the thing that I want to be in focus, if I was a photographer in this case would be the queen. And if I was using a larger opening, okay, my foreground and my background is going to be out of focus. All right, it's going to be out of focus. And I'm allowing more light in. Okay, we don't, we, we won't talk about light, but we're just talking, we're just going to talk about depth of field. Now, on the other hand, when I use a smaller opening, everything will be in focus. Okay, so this is just for your information as a photographer, what depth of field are you trying to achieve? Do you want to show more of the scene or less of the scene? Do you want your viewers to look at a specific place of the scene or do you want them to look at the overall picture of the scene it all comes down to what you want your viewer to see all right if i want my viewer to see the queen i would use this aperture number if i want my viewer to see all of them i will set it to that number it is all about your intention of what you want to show okay cool so there are just some things to remember once again okay so to put it into words and into notes, if you want to take this down, a shallower depth of field would also mean that your image would be brighter. Okay, get this idea in your head. If you want to start adding in your cool bokeh effects and everything, you want to shoot like Brandon Wofo, you want to shoot like all of these cool photographers on Instagram, you need to use a larger opening. Okay, if you want to get those cool looking effects. But in contrast, you need to now play around with everything else. Okay. On another side, on another side that I didn't mention yet is you can also achieve a shallow depth of field, or you can change your depth of field when you're using different lenses. How? Oh. <laughs> I will get to that when we talk about lenses. But if you want to achieve a shallower depth of field and you don't want to change your aperture setting try moving closer to your subject if that's possible if that's not possible then you have no choice but if you want to achieve it without changing your aperture number try moving closer to them and then you will start to notice for those of you who are into macro photography you already know this the closer you go to your to your subject right when you start bringing your lens very close right when you go extremely close you will start to notice that the depth of field is really, really shallow. Like it's just millimeter lengths, right? It's so shallow. You're just getting a very small detail, right? So that's just a representation. Uh, to those of you who don't know what I'm talking about, if you have a phone or you have a camera, try it out with your lens. Go really close and see how far you can get to for your camera to still, exp to still be able to focus. And you will start to notice a lot of blur in your viewfinder or whatever, and only a small part of your subject will be in focus. Okay. Okay. Uh, all right. So we are hopefully gathering all of our idea. We're hopefully gathering all of our ideas together. Okay. So now to consolidate everything, to bring it all together. All right, into one big happy family of the exposure triangle. We are coming together. This is how we should think about capturing good images. Okay, 
capturing good quality images? What should be your thought process as a photographer? This is how I would usually go about things, okay? It's a four-step process, all right? So we'll go through it one by one as a, as, as, um, like you and me, okay? Step by step, one, two, three, four. This is how it's gonna be, okay? So firstly, think about your depth of field, okay? What is your intention? What do you want to show in your photograph? Do you just wanna show a person? Do you wanna show the scenery? Do you want to show the background as well? Decide that first. So that means you need to set your aperture, okay? Deal with your aperture. Next, think about your ISO, okay? Now, I said before, use the lowest that you can possibly use, okay? Use it and set the shutter speed to a point where if you were handheld, that you wouldn't um, see your camera shake motion blur anymore, okay? Now, it varies from person to person. For me, I can go to as low as one upon 80, and I still don't have my own camera shake. I guess my hands are steady sometimes, but it varies from person to person how steady your hands can be. So for me, my starting point for shutter speed would be one upon 80, because I can keep my hands steady enough. But for everyone else, hopefully you can start to use one upon 125. So if that still doesn't work and your images are still dark, all right, if they're still dark and you're still seeing motion blur, increase your ISO, okay? Start to increase it. Start to add a little bit more noise and sacrifice the quality just a little bit so that you can get your exposure right. And if that's still not working, if you just keep on increasing your ISO, to the point where it's just too much, now you have to go back and start to rethink where you can sacrifice. Do you think you can really keep your hands steady? Can you take that shutter speed uh, lower? Can you do that? Can you sacrifice your depth of field just a little bit more so that you can allow more light in? Ask yourself those questions in this order, all right? So number one, aperture. Number two, lowest ISO and a good set of a shutter speed. If it's still too slow and you're still seeing blur, increase the shutter speed. And if it's still not bright enough, increase your ISO. If your ISO reaches a point where it, there's just too much noise, bring it down and start to sacrifice everything else, okay? This is the best thought process I believe is for, for everyone to use in order for you to start to really have a concrete understanding of what you should be thinking about as a photographer when you are outside, okay? Or in any situation, think about it in this way first, okay? Now, of course, this, is, this isn't going to apply all the time. Maybe you're in sports. That means your shutter speed is more important. So I won't get into that, but it's just a general thing, okay? Cool. So along with that, I'll just leave you all with good numbers to start using. Um, to those of you who are already photographers, maybe you have your own you have your own settings that you like to use. Personally, these are mine. So I like to range my numbers around here. So between ISO 200 to 800, aperture setting, depending on your lens, 2.8 to 5.6. And for shutter speed, I always like to go a bit higher than 1.125, all right? Cool, so you can just take this down if you want. 200 to 800. F 2.8 to 5.6 and one upon one to five onwards. All right. Okay. And with that, we'll take a break. <laughs> I really want to stretch. Actually, I've been sitting down for too long and I want to stretch. So um, I will open up Slido. Okay. I'll open up Slido again for anyone who has any questions. Hopefully, for you guys who are watching on Facebook or YouTube, you're still here. <laughs> Because we, we are here for a pretty long time today. So I'm just going to open up the slide up on the screen. I'm going to bring it up. And you can leave all the questions that you want over there. And I'll answer them when I get back. Right? I'm going to take a break for maybe 5 to 10 minutes because I, I really got to stretch. Right? Okay, so I'm, uh, I'm going to open up Slido here. Show polls. Uh, okay, full screen first. 
full screen, share screen. All right, now hopefully this screen is seen for everyone. So for those of you who are on Facebook, if you're just joining us, if you want to send me a question, uh, go to slido.com and enter in this code that you can see 62719, put it in, you will see a prompt and you can send the question to me and I'll answer it. All right, so I'm gonna take a break for like 10 minutes, five minutes, 10 minutes, hopefully five minutes so that because I don't want to keep you guys here for too long and we'll get back to the session after, all right? So I'll see you all in a bit. I'm gonna just stretch, drink some water, maybe get a snack and I'll be right back, all right? Intermission, let's go, all right. Oh my God. Um, teacher, you're unmuted. We can hear you. <laughs> All right. I think we're having our break. So that's it. No, anybody want to share something? Want to talk? Or somebody wants to sing? Just in advance, again, I would like to encourage you all. Uh, if you have any suggested topics, okay, don't forget to inform your coordinators, teachers, or you can directly send us in our uh, Facebook page. Okay, we will be having public speaking, uh, basic guitar lessons, and soon we will visit also your, your schools and universities. Any questions? Any who wants to share something? I hope uh, we learned something from the webinar. And I hope that uh, you are not getting bored. <laughs> Teacher, can you please give us a peek of what the certificate will look like? <laughs> oh, later. Uh, our event coordinator, uh, Sir Dante, is going to show you the certificate. Like the template book? Again? Like the template book? Ah, the template, yes. Okay. We will also be visiting to your schools here, to those schools here is involved because we will be giving also certificates uh, to the schools and universities who participated uh, in this webinar. Anybody wants to sing or to share something? I think one of the amazing uh, places that uh, you know we can uh, take photos will be in the expo, expo area, where you can see different pavilions. Like if you are into architecture, if you're into structures, buildings, so this expo will be an amazing uh, place or uh, venue. And I hope I can, uh, we can bring the students, uh, university schools, you know, we will have an exposure in the expo once, the, once it is allowed to go out and once the uh, pandemic is over. I want to recognize uh, some teachers here. I want to hear from teacher Veronica. Are you still there, teacher? <laughs> yes, sir. Good afternoon. Good afternoon, teacher. Yes, I would like to say thank you very much to Philso Club for this kind of opportunity given to us to attend this kind of seminar. It's a big help for our students. And uh, I would like to, as an activity coordinator, I would like to, can I request, sir? Sure, to have yeah to have another webinar sure if it is possible to have the uh, video editing video editing yeah 
very sure we will going to have that uh, video editing topic and I will also request uh, Colleen, no? or maybe she can do it. That's a good suggestion. That suggestion, uh, Miss Veronica. Ah, yes, speaking of film, filmography, uh, we are planning to have a uh, Filipino film festival. So I can also invite one of the Filipino, active Filipino here, who's into film, no? so that uh, we can have a uh, webinar also. If, if we are allowed to go out, then uh, we can supposedly have like uh, seminars and, uh, I mean, physical uh, trainings. But for the moment, uh, we can do the webinars. Hernandez Cohen, I'm getting bored too. <laughs> <laughs> We're getting bored, but at least we learned something. But thank you again for the patience. And the important thing there, we may not learn everything, but at least no, uh, we, we learn something from photography. Teacher, could you do an advanced score for photography, Po? Sure, we can uh, just uh, provide or suggest specific uh, topics because, of course, when we talk about photography, it's a really a, a huge, you know, it's a vast uh, topic. And of course, uh, each one of us here wanted to know about a specific topic, you know. Thank you, Hernandez Cohen. Thank you for Philso for giving us an opportunity to participate in this amazing webinar. We have learned a lot from Far Eastern Private School, Halwan. Thank you also, uh, Jess Marby you know, and uh, Tutep. Very, uh, you're all very active, no? Especially also to Adam, he's very active, very... <laughs> Thank you, Paul. <Pop. laughs> But really, once the uh, pandemic is over, I would like to bring all of you uh, that uh, we can visit the expo site because Philsop also is having a collaboration with the expo, uh, aside from Philippine team, so from the Dubai team, okay? Where in fact, we also have the schedules that uh, from our part, being Filipinos, okay? And as a community, we can make a big event in the expo. So I wish to coordinate with your teachers, uh, with your administrators, so that uh, maybe we can make a great, a big presentation production during the expo. But really, I would love to bring all of you in the expo because initially before the pandemic, they already gave me an invitation to bring Filipinos uh, and in advance, an advanced exposure visit to the site. So my first priority now is to bring all of you students and youth to the venue. Okay, let's get back. I think uh, Colin is back. <laughs> Let me think of a question. What's a good question to ask photographers? What's a good? <laughs> All right. Hello. All right. I am back. Wow. Let me open up my video here. Whew. Going strong, everyone. We're going strong. <laughs> okay. So um, now we're back here. Um, from here, do we have any new questions from this slide? Let's all go through them. Is there manual aperture control webcams? Well, Adam, let me tell you this. What do you think I'm using right now? <laughs> Wait, you're using an aperture controlled webcam? Uh, yeah, you can say that. 
Oh, that's cool. <laughs> yeah, so basically I have a camera set up to be my webcam and that's how I'm um, talking to all of you. So it's, it's actually possible to set up your cameras to your computers if you want to use them as webcams. It's, it's a bit complicated, you need to watch a couple of videos, but it is possible. You can use your cameras as your webcams. It, the option is there for you. Just need a couple of things. Of course, in the camera, you need a lens, right? And a couple more, but it's possible. It's possible, you can use that if you really want to, right? If you think it's too dark, you can adjust it, so, okay. Why does noise come from high ISO numbers and long exposure times? Um, I think I covered this already um, over there. So, but to just say it again, when your light, when light is entering to the sensor or film, there will be random moments when that light is hitting parts of the image that you don't want it to hit. You're giving a larger margin of error for your sensor or your film to trip up and not get the right thing. Okay. Since you said in the beginning your type of photography is events, what else do you want to explore currently exploring in terms of photography and style? Oh. All right. Um. Um, at the moment, I am exploring portraiture. So portraits, because we're kind of in the quarantine edition, usually if I want to go out now, it's very dangerous. So if I know someone, Maybe I might go over their place or they come over to mine and just take some portraits, take interesting things with everyone. It's just the thing I'm exploring now. Eventually, I think I mentioned last week, I want to do nature and travel the world, that type of thing. I want to go everywhere. So that's why those questions that I asked earlier, like I want to travel the world too. I wanted to go to, actually, I've always wanted to go to Rome, to be honest. I think Rome is such an interesting place and there's just so much old architecture to appreciate there and the museums and the arts and it's just amazing so that's where i wanted to go it's like one of my bucket list my bucket list places to go so there you go so i'm exploring portraiture right now i also want to do photojournalism like street photography when everything's safe so yeah. ever use the gopro yes adam i have used the gopro um it is it's, it's, I, think, I think it's the GoPro 5, if I'm not mistaken. I've used that. Not all the time, but it's very nice to have a wide shot, right? It has a wide angle lens. Okay. What does ISO stand for? Okay, so ISO actually stands for, I, if I'm not mistaken, it's called the International Standardized Organization. I know it's weird because it doesn't have anything to do with, with cameras, International Standardized Organization, if I'm not mistaken. I think that's what it is. But the, the term ISO and where it came from is it was just somehow a unit that was, was introduced in order for us to have something to use to determine the sensitivity of light. Because there was no real, there was no real term to use for, for it, right? There was no real term to use. Before it was called film speed, but when it was starting to be translated to the digital form, it was, there was nothing else to use. So we ended up using some numbers from ISO and that just got normalized, our ISO numbers, our sensitivities for our cameras. Consider it like a standard unit. Standard, yeah. yeah, consider it like a standard unit, right? That's where, because ISO is an organization that handles all of these standardized units. They create units for abstract things. So we just adapted a number from them in the field of photography. What is the most challenging part of being a photographer? Learning. <laughs> Learning and accepting you are not the best. Um, maybe you might humble yourself at some point, but when you start to realize that there's just so much to learn, it's just you get that feeling of wow i'm not really i'm not really all of that sometimes but of course you need to you need to put yourself in a position where you are learning positively you're putting that positive mindset a growth mindset when you're learning right you want to improve your skill you want to really show the world what you can do as an artist as a photographer or in just anything that you love doing right 
So the most challenging thing is really learning and to accept that you're not always going to be the best, but it is really nice to aim to be the best. All right. Cool. My old camera is vibrating randomly. I'm not sure. <laughs> I'm not sure, Adam, but uh, maybe we can talk about it uh, in private if you want to have a conversation. <laughs> what is the best photography style to start off? Oh, okay, so to start off, oh, I love this question. To start off, it is actually going to be events, okay? Events photography is the best way to start off. Or if you want a really beginner-friendly one, it is portraits. And the reason being is because it's easy for you to have these subjects, okay? And you won't have too much of a problem to, how should you say, you won't have any problems in gathering these subjects for, you, for yourself. Like if you're talking about portraits, you can just take pictures of your family, your friends. That's easy, right? And then along the way, you can learn how to use cool things because Portraits, you don't have to think of it in a way where you have to hire models. You need to get a studio or, you know, all of these things. You don't. To get started, you can start with your family members and your friends. Take pictures of them, right? It's easy. The subjects are there for you. Try it out, right? Easy. Other thing is events because events is basically like birthdays and things like that. And over there, you will now start to realize what your settings can really play a role in when you're outside and you're because most of the time if you're a photographer i feel that you would generally be asked to cover a birthday party or you might be asked to go for i don't know all of those types of small events that are happening and this is just another way to start off you know you want to freeze motion you want to show motion you want to get shallower depth of fields experiment so my advice for that as a beginner Portraiture is pretty good and events photography. That's the easiest. Because for street, what you mentioned for street, it's kind of difficult because it's sometimes you will have trouble with people, right? You'll have trouble, trouble with people if you're thinking about street photography with people. But if it's just still stuff, then sure, that's good. But this is just my take on it. Okay. For you, sir, does the camera affect photography skill? No, <laughs> it, it doesn't. I know this is just the most cliche answer, but it really isn't the gear. It's, it's never the gear. It's always the eye of the photographer and what they're trying to, to show you, okay? True, you can make an argument that better gear does equal better results. True, but think of it this way. If you don't have the best gear, you are putting yourself in a challenged position, okay? You're challenging yourself a bit more. And because you are challenging yourself a bit more, your growth will be much more than someone who has all the expensive gear in the world, all of those things, like they have it easier for them to do whatever they want to do. They won't grow as much because they don't need to learn all of these things that you would be learning because you didn't have the best gear at the start of your journey okay so this is how i would look at it if you if you're thinking about gear specifically it affects it in some way but if you don't have the right gear yet and if you're still working your way towards it it's really a beautiful experience you're growing because you're challenging yourself even more and that my friends is how we should view this you know never lives okay let's go okay so um, because the, <laughs> because we still have a couple of things to to talk about, I won't answer too many more of these questions because I want this to continue. Right? I want our wow. There's also stuff in Zoom chat. Okay, I'll get to that later. All right, I'll get to that later in in our final q a when the whole session is and we can have uh all of the questions answered okay so now let's move forward everyone <laughs> we're going to do our final push everyone our final push and now we're, we can conclude our day together all right so please hang on hang with me 
we're gonna be chilling together and hopefully uh we can end on a good note okay all right so allow me to share the very ending part of our webinar today okay present let's go share let me just bang all right now coming back <laughs> coming back to it now we're going to be talking about lenses okay so last week i already talked about it in small detail okay so um, in smaller detail it's just an entry point of light into the camera it it does cool things you can focus with it you can do cool things with it right all of these cool things now i'm going to explain to you what are the different types of lenses you will come across and what are the effects of those lenses and what are they going to do to your images all right so when you come across lenses nowadays now that it's becoming more modern you would be distinguishing them by distinguish i mean you would be separating them from each other like how you would be knowing which lens is what it is by their focal length and by focal length i mean a millimeter number if you want me to explain what a focal length is a focal length or defocal length is basically the distance between the lens and your sensor or your film it's basically a, a, a certain distance away okay i'll explain that in a bit yeah I'll, I'll show you a practical example of what this means all right so the lenses that you will come across when you're having a digital or film cameras are these are just some of them so when i said they were distinguished by focal lengths you would be calling your lenses by their focal length you don't call them i have a small lens i have a long lens i have a medium lens well, what is a medium lens it's just medium like it's not a shirt size okay it's 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 more about the focal lengths okay so you would come across lenses like the 50 millimeter lens the 24 to 70 millimeter lens maybe an 80 to 200 millimeter lens so all of these if you would notice is that if, as the numbers are increasing the length is getting longer right length focal length <laughs> okay so this is how everything is being distinguished in terms of lenses okay so there are different types and i will try to explain what are the different reasons you would be using different lenses like at all because most of us if we just bought our cameras we have a lens called a kit lens and that millimeter range is between 18 to 55 right so if you ever notice those numbers here this is basically your variable focal length that you are changing on your lens all right cool so here we go so as an as a general idea, when you are using a lower focal length, okay, your field of view is going to be greater. All right, so what do I mean by this? Okay, so I'm going to give you guys a small exercise, okay, maybe I just thought about it. All right, so if, all, if you put your hands in front of you, yourself, okay, maybe you have space, maybe you don't, but if you put your hands in front of you, okay, and you're looking straight, okay and now when you start to move your hands towards your side while you're still looking straight so i'm still looking at you but I, as i keep on expanding right as i keep on expanding my hands there will come a point where i can't see my arms anymore right i can't see the hand to my right right now it is outside of my field of vision and i'm looking straight i really can't see it it's like a blind spot so similarly, right, your lenses, if you're using a lower focal length, you can see much more. You can see much wider. So if I use a lower focal length lens, I can actually be able to see my hand. It's already over here. I can't see it right now. But if I, you know, have a, I don't know, lens for eyes, <laughs> if I have a photography lens for eyes, then I can see it over here. Okay. So this is this is just a diagram of what you would be able to achieve with different focal lengths okay so in your phones if you might have noticed because i know there are some people out there who have cool looking phones you know spend a good number of it 
when you select the wide angle feature, okay, when you select the wide camera, this is what you're technically showing. You are getting a wider field of view. So you are you therefore using a lower focal length, okay? And this is just a representation of what is happening. So if you're using a 16 millimeter lens, which is, the, which is a fish eye lens, okay? You are getting 180 degrees. You're getting everything in front of you. That's crazy. You can view everything. It's just so wide. And then now those numbers, as they increase, you are narrowing. You are narrowing your field of view. So you are closing it in and really being focused at a certain point, right? The higher number you go, the more narrow it gets. Okay? And so it's technically like you're zooming, all right? But when you think about zoom, you are actually narrowing your field of view. Okay? And so this is just another diagram. We call our lenses differently by their focal lengths. So at the start from the very widest, so the lower numbers, you would call them ultra wide angle lenses. And as you go higher, you will start to call them wide angle lenses. At some point, they will be called the standard lens. And when you're reaching the very big and long ones, that's where it's becoming telephoto. Okay. And when it's an extreme one, when you're using it for like astrophotography or you're doing it for nature and you're trying to capture animals and stuff like that, that's super telephoto. Okay. So these are just some terms that you just have to know. Don't worry. And the reason why that's called standard in that range is our eyes are very closely linked to the number of 50 millimeters. Okay. So when we're using a 50 millimeter lens, that is almost a direct representation of our view on the world. So if you want to get, if you want to cap capture images realistically by how we are seeing it, use a 50 millimeter lens. That is the perfect focal length for you if you really want to show things through your field of view or through anyone's, through a human's field of view, there we go, human, all right? So when we start to use different lenses, however, yeah, something changes as well. It's not just a field of view, it's also a perspective. Now, what do I mean by perspective? Okay, the only way for me to explain this properly is to show you, okay? When we start using wide angle lenses, okay, when we use that feature on our phone, when we start to play around with all of our cool settings and using those lenses, things start to change. They just look very curved and weird. And for example, look at this Eiffel Tower, like a wide angle lens was used. And now you have this extremely weird looking curve. Like, that's not there. Okay, the curve is there. Excuse me, when you go there, but it doesn't look like this. Like it's, it's at least in some way it's straight. Like this part is actually somewhat more or less straight in a way. Like it's not just so wild, it's just weird looking. Right, but even so, I don't know why I'm choking up. Maybe I'm thirsty. <laughs> Ooh. Can I get a glass of water, please? I'm choking up, guys. I think I'm getting pretty dry in my throat. <laughs> okay, so, based, so as we keep going, more examples here. So for when you're capturing um, animals or whenever you're facing yourself here and you're using wide angle lenses, you're, it's like you're somehow adding an imaginative sphere to your images. For example, look at this, right? It seems as if there is a curved sphere that's somehow distorting the image. Thank you. Right, and similarly, Wow, that's so much better. Similarly, over here in this uh, landscape, well, not landscape, but um, this street, you can see that there is a huge curve that is noticeable over here. Like this curve isn't actually there. This curve is probably a straight, a straight, well, maybe it's not straight, but it's just more emphasized that there is a curve because of the effect of a wide angle lens. Okay, so this is just what's going to be happening. So, in order for you to understand it a bit more, <laughs> in order for you to understand this a bit more, 
okay? This is what's happening, okay? So when you are using a wider lens, okay, you are making your perspectives deeper. And what I mean by that is you can really show the distance of something or the length of something in your images. How is that? This is the example. When you're using a wide angle lens and you're closer to your subject, you will start to see, excuse me, you will start to see that image of distance being shown. Um, practical example on Instagram, if any of you, since we're all young here, if any of you have seen those hype beast cool photographs of sneaker heads and they are all lower angle, right? They have their shoes and they're like, you know, you're, you're taking pictures of them there. I'll, technically, because they look so tall and big, a wide angle lens is actually being used to capture them. Okay, there you go. So if you ever want to be hype beast, guys, you know, you can get a wide angle lens. <laughs> if you ever want to be into that, you know, be a sneakerhead. That's my hot tip. All right, so on the opposite end, Okay, on the opposite end of things, when you are using a longer lens, okay, when you're using a longer millimeter lens, that steep effect is now being reduced. And what you're doing is you are flattening your image, okay? You're flattening it. You're making it look like everything is on the same plane. The best way for me to show you this is with examples, right? Okay, so here's an example of using a wide angle lens and using a telephoto lens. All right, so over here, you can see that the distance between your elements in a photograph is very emphasized. Like, look at this. This looks like it is 10 feet away or something. I mean, the lake just looks even further, and the house is just so far away. Like, that is, it's like you're telling your viewer that it's that house is extremely far away. That's what I'm getting from this photograph. And a wide angle lens was being used. On the opposite end, however, if you're using a telephoto lens, what is happening is now everything is becoming flat. It looks as if everything is just closer together, right? Isn't that interesting? <laughs> okay, so this is what's happening, okay? So whenever you're, you'll find yourself zooming in, just think of it as a secondary effect that you are also flattening your images. And if you are zooming outwards, you are adding more depth or distance between the elements of your image. Okay. Okay, I hope that's somewhat clear. Somewhat clear. Okay. Okay, so this is just an example of, um, of what would happen when you start to use longer lenses. Okay, so in, in, the, in the application or in this scene, actually, there's a street that is separating those two buildings. Okay, there's a street. But because a telephoto lens was used, it now looks like those buildings were being merged with each other, right? It's like they're just... They're like together and it looks really weird. Like I don't I don't think this is a good image at all. It looks kind of weird, right? So this is the effect in extremes of what would happen when you start using like longer lenses. Okay, you're making it so that it's just sticking together even more. So you're making it flat. All right. Flat. Okay, so this is just um, to put it into words. When you're using longer lenses, you flatten your perspective and your elements would look like they're on the same plane. Okay, okay, we're almost there, guys. <laughs> we are almost there. We're almost at the very end. Okay, so quick tips, everyone. So just quick, quick tips. When you're using a longer lens, um, it is usually an easier lens to use when you are trying to capture people from further away. Now, why is that? Right, so why is it good to take pictures from further away. It is good because you are removing that conscious feeling that people get when they have a lens pointed at them. Maybe you all might have experienced this already. Okay, maybe when someone flipped out their phone and they're taking a picture of you, suddenly you're like, oh, am I, am I, am I wearing the right clothes? Am I, is my face okay? Is my makeup okay? Is my hair okay? Is my 
smile, <laughs> right? So in a way, the closer you are to someone with your camera or that, or your phone or whatever, your lens, right? The more conscious they kind of get. So this is just a small effect what is happening. You know, when you start to move further away and you're taking pictures of them from further away, it's gonna be less conscious. So this is usually good when you're taking pictures of kids, you know, animals, pets, right? It's pretty good if you don't want them to react and you want to make sure you get them in the scene without them, you know, being too, oh, I want to hide or whatever. It's good for candids, guys. So you want to have a nice candid shot of someone with a long lens. So for the extremes, I think I already talked about that. So the extremes of the focal length, so extremely wide or extremely um, narrow, extremely wide or an extremely narrow field of view, you're technically doing different effects to your images, right? It's not the same as what we're viewing in our you know, daily lives as a human, right? We don't see the same things that camera is able to produce. So it's kind of cool and artistic and you can really play around and have really nice fun with your photographs when you're using different lenses. So 50mm, I already mentioned that. And like I said earlier, when you're using a longer lens, okay, when you're using a longer lens, you can achieve a shallower depth of field, okay? But just think about it this way. Because you're using a longer lens and you're zooming in more, it's heavier and a small movement can change your scene very quickly. A very small movement can change what you're looking at, all right? So just think about it this way. You need to use a faster shutter speed when you are now using longer lens, okay? Okay, okay guys, we are almost there. The fish in the town. <laughs> we are almost there, friends. We are almost there. We're almost there. Okay, so if you have any questions, leave them on Slido. I'll get to them lastly, okay? So now I will go through this very quickly, okay? Hopefully, I can finish before 6.15. That's my goal, okay? My goal is to finish this before 6.15. So everyone, please bear with me. I am also getting a bit tired and exhausted <laughs> talking continuously for like two hours and a half. But hopefully you guys are able to get in some really nice information. And now we'll be talking about composition. All right, we're talking about composition. So I actually have a separate, separate presentation for this. So I'm just gonna switch it up real fast. Okay, stop sharing. I'll open it up in my separate presentation over here because I feel like it should be different. Boom, present. Let's go back to Zoom. All right, here we are. Here we are, you guys. So now it's going to be all about composition. So earlier, everything that I talked to you about is all scientific. Everything was logical, scientific, and it's just all about math and numbers. So now we're getting to the fun stuff. Hopefully I can keep you guys interested because when it comes to composition, now we're dealing with art, okay? Now it's more about photography as an art form and what is a really, what are the good things that you have to keep in mind when you are going around and taking pictures, okay? Now it's all about arranging your elements and how can you make your photographs look even better than if you were now more aware. Hopefully. <laughs> so, uh, of course, I got my sources from here and there. So maybe some of you might already know these, but I'm just going to give my my opinions. And I also I'm also going to show some more of my work. <laughs> I'm also getting I'm also going to show some of my work with you all. I don't post a lot on Instagram, but you know I do get a chance. So I am going to. Uh, hopefully still keep going thanks guys for the support <laughs> okay so let's go let's go guys so composition is all about telling a story to your viewer okay so when you are now thinking about it in a new way it isn't only about your exposure anymore it's also about what you want to tell the people viewing your image Okay, what do you want them to know? Are you trying to show them a person? Are you trying to show them a person is sad? Are you trying to show them a plane traveling? Are you trying to show them this? So 
You know that saying where a picture is worth a thousand words? It's exactly that, okay? So you're, now you have the power as a photographer, okay, to say those thousands of words with your photographs. And hopefully you know the weight of that capability and you will try to get your images to look as visually pleasing as you can, all right? Okay, so when we're talking about photography now, okay, as an art form, what is what we're doing is because of how we view the world in 3D, we can really see it in a different way. And our challenge as photographers is to put ourselves into a 2D mindset. Okay, now everything, now that's the, that's kind of a determinant skill that we'll start to practice, okay? Because showing depth in a 2D image is difficult. It's not easy, right? Showing that. And if you're able to do that, I believe, you know, you're well on your way in becoming the best photographer in the world. Right? If you are able to really show what you can do with the cameras in your hands, with the phones or whatever you're using in your hands to really showcase what you can do as a photographer, then, you know, I hope to see you all there. You know, come there with me, right? I'm still getting there, but the option is there for everyone to join. Okay. So generally a desired goal that's good for everyone to keep track of is you need to have it visually pleasing okay you don't want too many things happening you don't want wild colors you don't want all of these things you want to make sure that the viewer is relaxed or not relaxed but you want to make sure that they understand what is happening or what your main intention was when you were taking a picture just like painting okay because painting is a thorough process where you really do think about what you want to put into your into your piece, into the canvas, right? So similarly in photography, take each element, right? Take each element and really think about how they're going to look like in your images, right? Now, one more thing that you can also do, because you are now in that position, you can direct the viewer, right? You can really play around with where their eyes will actually be going. So there's so many things that you can do, you can make, excuse me, you can make your, you can make parts of your image brighter because, okay, quick tip, if you want your viewers to look somewhere in your images, our eyes are trained to look at the brighter parts first. Okay, quick tip. I didn't put it here, I should have put it there, but generally when in our images, and you might have noticed, like if you start having that at the back of your head when you're looking through Facebook or wherever, Instagram, you would notice yourself looking at the brighter parts first, okay? So as a photographer now, if you are going to be editing or whichever, just know that you or your eyes are naturally drawn to more images. That is kind of why we add vignettes. So we know what a vignette is. Basically, we're darkening the corners of our images so that we can view the brighter center, right? Cool. So this is just a way of how we're directing, how we are directing the viewer's eyes. Okay, why, why am I doing this? <laughs> how we are, how we are um, directing them. Okay. So of course, clarity is important. You need to know what you're taking, right? Know what you're taking. Don't be confused. Don't add too many things randomly. Know what you want to take. All right. Once again, it's the same thing. Make sure that you know what your main subject is and know what you are trying to show the viewer, all right? So now I think my next slide is going to be the tips and the whole tip. So with me, I have 10. So time check, we have 10 minutes, so one minute each for, for these, all right? We're going to go through them as quickly as we can, hopefully one minute each, all right? So the first one is going to be fill your frame, okay? So that is to utilize the maximum amount of the, the maximum amount of the frame. Wow, I, I need I need help in grammar. I think I was just too tired when I was making this. <laughs> uh, basically, what it is is use use the maximum amount of space in the frame for your photograph. All right. In this way, your subject is more noticed, and it's more and they're more um, in the scene, and there's nowhere else for your viewers' eyes to draw their eyes to. Okay, there's nowhere else because now you have your subject right in front of them. Okay, these are just examples of some of 
my picture that I've taken. So all of the examples that I'll be showing were personal pictures that I have taken. So uh, as you can see, it works really well with portraits. Now I don't have other examples for fill your frame, but as you can see, the more you fill your frame of a subject, the more attention you are drawing to whatever they're doing or if you afford for the scene. So especially for her, right? I forgot what she was doing here when this image was taken, but um, uh, you can really show so many things when you start to really fill your frame, okay? To remove the negative space and to really, um, to really make use of how much your subject can occupy. I'm seeing a lot of things in the chat. Let me just open it up real quick. <laughs> Yeah, thanks guys. All right, so let's move on to the next one. The next one is gonna be the rule of thirds. Okay, so this is just, you're gonna see this everywhere and maybe photographers have already told you to use the rule of thirds. So of course I have to mention that. Okay, so the rule of thirds is dividing your shot into nine equal sections using two horizontal and vertical lines. So what it is, is it's basically a grid. Okay, it's a grid that you will see Maybe in your photo editing softwares and all, when you're taking pictures, you might end up seeing a grid with you where you have it split up. Okay, so where am I in my, in my camera? I can see my camera. Okay, so for example, those grids, if you're looking at my camera right now, would be here and here. Okay, so I'm splitting it up into three equal parts, vertically and horizontally, okay? So the reason why this is like a concept in photography is just all about balancing your subjects, not putting them too far away from the edges and not in putting them too in the center. Because when, it's, when your subject's in the center, sometimes it just, it's not the most pleasing thing to see, okay? But all it is, when you're using the rule of thirds, use it as a guide for yourself to Mm, capture images in a good way. So this is an example. Okay, so I remember I was, so if you guys know the UAE, I think this is just somewhere close to the docks where you can ride, I won't call it docks, I won't, I won't call that place. But basically in that place where um, you can ride boats for like one dirham. So those of you who are in UAE, you know where this is, but this is just an example of the rule of thirds when you're using. So what I did in this shot was I split my image up into three. So I have my guys here accordingly, and I split it up to have this as their, like their main, you know, their main point of interest. So I'm drawing, so technically I'm trying to draw the attention of the viewer to what they're doing, right? This is clear. They're moving stuff around, right? In the third. Now, another way you can use this is when someone is talking, if you want, you can put them maybe at the left side with their eyes facing towards the right to show that they are looking somewhere, right? That's also an application of rule of thirds, and you can also do that. There's so many applications you can do, but the main thing that you have to remember is you're putting your elements, putting your main subjects on those lines, or if not on those lines, on those intersecting points of those lines. Okay, I should have put those lines here actually, that was my bad, but yeah, okay. So next, we're going to be talking about leading lines. Okay, so what they are is throughout life, you will see a lot of lines everywhere, like your doorway, your, your, your TV, your, I'm looking at my room right now, your, your tripod, your table, your chair, your, <laughs> you will see lines everywhere. And what you can do in your images is you can really direct and pave a path for your viewers to see something. Right. And generally, because they are they are lines and they give us somewhat a journey through the screen or through what your image is, you know, it's just a bit of fun for us to really get to follow. Oh, where is it taking us? You know, we we subconsciously think about it. Like we just don't always have it in our minds, but it's just there. Right? We just it's just there. Right? We just, we just don't know it's happening, but it is actually happening. All right. So just I won't go through the points, but this is just what it is. The term leading is used because the lights take us on a journey. So this is an example. Okay, this is, is an example. So what I took here, 
I think this is in Fujera, if I am Fujera, so one of our emlets. What I took here, as you can see, I am trying to lead your eyes up these stairs to look at. I think this is, I don't know if it's a fort, I mean, it's a fort, right? So my goal as a photographer for, you, for, for the viewers was for them to see where it's going, right? You're technically following these lines going upwards to the fort. And similarly on the right side, okay, it's like a corridor. So now you can see that I want you to look in a general direction, right? And I want you to look at my main subject over here. Isn't that cool, right? Cool. So this is how, these are just some of the ways you can use leading lines. Of course, leading lines don't have to be straight. They can also be curved, but just think of it as an artistic piece that you can use in your photography. Okay. All right. Next. Next up, my coolest thing. All right. Next up is symmetry and patterns. All right. So of our eyes. So I know we have this joke where we say, oh, it's so OCD, or oh, I have this, or oh, I just want it to be straight, I want it to be symmetrical, I really need to put it there. We're going to use that as a way to kind of cheat in photography because we want to enhance everyone's experience by showing these patterns in our lives, okay? Because naturally, we like to see things in order, we like to see things in patterns, it is our oddly satisfying needs that we have to fulfill. So as an example, as an example, because they are, oh, I don't have an example. Okay, here's the example. All right, I knew I had an example. Here's an example, okay? So when you start to see like patterns here and there around wherever you are, um, the reason why it's so pleasing is because it's, it's just, I know it's an artist, there's so many artistic terms I'm losing track of saying, but the main thing I want to get across to all of you is that it is aesthetically nice to look at because it is in order, it is fulfilling our needs for things to be fixed, and there's just not too much going on, right? You are not upset when you look at a photo. Okay, maybe, fine, this, just because it's a bit slanted, okay, it's upsetting me just a little bit, but the intention of what I wanted to show was still there right okay so next we're going to be talking about halfway guys we're almost there <laughs> change your viewpoint okay so based on how we take photographs adjusting our viewpoint can create newer dynamics so remember what i said about height beast when you go low angle using wide low angle with a wide angle lens right you can really change the perspective of what your subject will look like to everyone okay so when you're shooting from down below you're going to make them look more dominating. You're going to make them look more powerful. You're going to make them really have more authority. And likewise, uh, this is just for about people, okay? This is more about portraiture, I know. So when you're taking a shot from above them, you know, technically, if you're in the eyes of the viewer, you are looking down on them, right? So there's a lot of psychology that plays into this, but it's now saying a different story than if you were down there than if you were up there, right? So this is an example, okay? So the example, so these are just random pigeons, right? They're just doing their thing, but because the shot was taken from under them, it somewhat looks like they have authority over where they're watching. It's like as if they are um, doing surveillance or something. These are your pigeons from, I don't know, Game of Thrones or something or whatever. You know, so there's just like, like so many cool things you can do depending on where you are taking the shot from. Okay, so have some fun. Maybe go towards the left a bit, go towards the right, go a bit lower angle. Generally, I think shooting lower angles are more fun because you can really play around with what you get to show with, with what you get to show to people. So have your fun, guys. Photography is very, very widespread and you will always learn something new. So next, now it's just adjusting the exposure settings, um, showing motion. I, I already talked about this in the aperture and shutter speed. You can play around with your depth of field to really showcase what you want people to see. As an example, as an example, when I'm using a shallow depth of field, I can like direct my viewer's attention to a certain point of the image. And this is pretty cool. I like this shot about this was taken in 
I think it was Sika Art Fair, which was in Bastakia. To those of you who are in the UAE, you know where it is. There was an art fair and then these were like displayed on the wall and I just, and I had my camera with me and this was pretty cool. Um, on the left side, it's just a bunch of cinnamon. And what I was able to do, I used a shallow depth of field. So I had a large opening and I am showing you, technically, I wanted to show you the textures of the cinnamon sticks right over here. And it's kind of cool. You know, you don't really get to see this all the time. You don't really get to like bring these closer to yourself or whatever. So in a way, I'm really telling you different stories from each of the images, right? So next is to add depth. So once again, like I said earlier, we are restricted to two-dimensional, to the two-dimensional space when we are taking photographs. So if we use our elements in a unique way, we can somehow show to our viewers that there is actually space in between what we have, okay? When you're adding stuff to your foreground, your middle ground and background. So this is an example. Okay, so what this cool thing is, is I have this figure as my foreground. My main subject is my middle ground, so this red one. And the background is just everything else, the wall, right? So what you are noticing is there is a sense of depth that this figure is actually closer to me than this figure. Right, pretty cool. Okay, so likewise over here, this was a this was a behind the scenes shot, but it just applies everywhere. Okay, you don't have to just confine yourself to still life and artistic things. You can also use it in events. So I was doing some behind the scenes shots of a friend of mine, and over here you can see this laptop first as our very big, as our our closest foreground, and then him, and then the model, right? So you can see the, I won't call it an illusion, but you can see that there, I'm trying to show this depth feeling in these photographs, all right? Okay, so I don't know what this is. I don't know if you can see that, but hopefully that's not too bothering. Okay, so uh, now I'll just leave you all with general tips. Oh my God, this little bit over. Okay, so number eight, slow down. Take your time and analyze how you can achieve the best possible shot of the situation. So really take a look at what you're photographing. Take your time. This doesn't apply when you're at street, but if you have the time, use it and try to get the best possible picture you can find because you never know when you might miss a shot, okay? This shot is actually one of my most favorites. This, the reason being was I was just getting back into photography again. And when we went on a photo walk one time, there was a cat who was on a dumpster. Okay, so that's where we were. And the cat was just looking at me, you know, just looking at me and he was just like, mm, you know, just staring right at me. And so I was like, okay, let me take a picture of you then. So I was already primed up. And what I noticed is that the cat wanted to yawn. So I really got ready. And I was just waiting for the perfect moment to snap the shot of a cat yawning and the shot that I was able to get, well, you can see it right now. It doesn't even look like the cat is yawning, but rather you can see the, what it's, you, the, what should I say? The message that you are kind of getting is not the yawn, but it's more like it's roaring or, you know, that type of look. So it's kind of different, right? So each moment is always going to be different. So take your time and maybe along that time, you might realize something that, you just would have missed it. You just, you know, took less time and you just snapped a picture and then you walked off. You never know. Like, take your time and analyze what you can, what's before your eyes and hopefully you can get the shots that you want. Okay? So almost to the last, guys, number nine, simplify. Basically what this means is just don't compact too many things in your photograph. Try to have as least amount of elements as possible as possible, you know, that text. Don't put too many things there. If you're trying to get a portrait, just have the person, don't make your background too noisy. Don't add different trees or whatnot, unless that's what you're going for. Try to make it as simple for the viewer to know what you're trying to say, as simple as possible. And lastly, guys, lastly, <laughs> lastly, 
I want everyone to, you know, leave today as thinking about photography as a fun experience. All right. So what I want everyone to still know is that as long as you're, you know, really interested in this and you're going to be buying a camera soon or you already have a camera, never forget and please do never forget to have fun. Okay. So at sometimes it might get tiring, but photography is just a full on process of learning. You will always learn something new that you didn't know. And the best part is you only can learn the best way when you are practicing, when you are actually taking pictures. You will start to know what settings are good to use. You will start to know what are the nice shots that you can take. It's something like muscle memory. You know, it will soon become so natural for you that everything will just be a bit easier than when you were still starting off. So don't restrict yourself sometimes. So everything I just mentioned, they're just guidelines. You know, they might listen to some rules that people say, but don't always stick to them. Always try to have fun. And hopefully with our day-to-day -day and feel suck, we can join a club. Maybe we can make one together, share pictures, go on walks, um, talk about photography and all of that. You know, when we add more people into our journey, we really make it, much more enjoyable all right so with that everyone i have now concluded our webinar for today i know we have been here together for quite some time and extremely long so um <laughs> so thank you so much for everyone who came um if you want to reach me i i already i'm gonna leave my instagram somewhere but that's like the best place um, if you want to have some more let our organizers know but thank you so much everyone for sticking around i think we can still have i'm not sure we still have enough time to do a q and I don't know but if you guys want to still ask me some questions i'll open up slido again but overall now we have now concluded and hopefully i can see you all taking photography to the next level so thank you so much guys this is Colin. I'm now going to go to the Slido for more questions and answers. All right. Okay. To check your camera. Uh, all right. Let's go. Okay. Wow. Wow, 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 wow. All right, so let's go over here, share, bang guys. All right, let's go. In my camera, it says slide lock to right. I fixed it, but still I'm not able to take pictures or access my camera. Slide lock to right. Hmm. Oh, maybe. Ah, okay. So this actually deals with your memory card. Okay. So I'm assuming that you're using an SD. Okay. I'm, yeah, I'm assuming you're using an SD card. So can I have an SD card? To show them what it, what it is. Okay. So I'll, I'll show you what it means. So hopefully you can understand. All right, so let me bring it up real quick. Where's my camera? Okay. So in your SD cards, if you bring it up, you can see this small switch on one side of it. I, I need to really zoom in to show you so that I can answer this. Okay. So in your SD card, there is actually a switch here. Okay. There's this switch that goes up and down. Okay. Now what this switch is, is exactly what you mentioned. It's a lock. All right. When it is locked, no information would be able to enter your SD card. This is kind of like a security thing, okay? So whenever you see this pop, pop up in your camera, this is, what, this is what it means. Your SD card maybe was set to the locked part, okay? And no information is able to enter your, your SD card. So you cannot save any cameras, okay? So hopefully that answered your question. I hope that's what it means. Slide locked, right? So yeah, that's what it means. 
for SD cards. I hope I answered your question. So just remember, guys, if you're using SD cards in your cameras, that lock part is there. Okay, so you might, you know, have that have that become a problem. Why did you say the most wholesome part of being a photographer? The most wholesome part of being a photographer is using it as an art form and as a way to challenge yourself. I think that's really the best thing about it. It's like you can challenge yourself in art and in your logical skill of trying to solve exposure problems. Like I mentioned, like today we talked about so many things and there was stuff where it's all about logic and light and science and on the other end, it's trying on the, on the other end, it's all about art and trying to really show the beautiful creations and things that we see in our daily lives and making it um, visually pleasing for everyone. So that's probably the most wholesome thing. Okay, what are effective techniques artists use? Oh, that's a very cool question. Um, because most of our der most of the things that have been derived in the composition rules have been used by artists from a long time ago. So for example, the Rembrandt technique, for example, in portraiture, uh, you have to look that up. It's Rembrandt, so R E M Rem R E M B R A N D T, the Rembrandt technique. Okay, so that technique, for example, is a portraiture, uh, it's a portraiture technique that was used by an artist, or he is Rembrandt, okay, so he was coined for it. And what it is, is like a cool technique to get a more cinematic look or dramatic look for your photograph and portraiture. So there's so many techniques that have been, you know, derived from artists and that's just one of them, right? So personally, I like to use Rembrandt. Uh, I also use, well, the golden ratio is another thing. I won't go into too much detail of the golden ratio, but the rule of thirds is actually more or less derived from the golden ratio, okay, and the Fibonacci sequence. There's just so many. There's just so many things. But of them, the rule of thirds and Rembrandt technique is the ones that I find myself using a lot. Okay. Smaller length of lenses, the wider. Yes. Yes. <laughs> that's the best that's the best thing I can say, yes. The, the smaller the length or the smaller the number, the wider the view. Shout out. Shout, shout, shout out. Shout out. All right, shout out to Dominic Cabanting. What's up, bro? <laughs> shout out, man. Shout out to you. All right. How you really how you really want to present your art, basically how to make the subject stand. Well, I just kind of explained that there are different ways in composition. <laughs> there are many there are many ways. And I don't want to go through composition all over again, but um that's <laughs> already uh yeah. So if you if you just generally like I said, a quick tip, one one of them is to fill your frame, make sure your subject is there. And it's the main thing that people will see. And your eyes are generally always drawn to the brighter parts of an image first. So if your background is extremely lit and your subject is dark, people will look at the background first than where your subject actually is. And so just keep it in mind, all right? Cool. What is the best all-rounder lens? Ooh, I love this question. Okay, so the best all-rounder lens is... A prime lens for me, because <laughs> I feel like a prime lens, so a prime lens is basically a lens that is, has a fixed focal length, so like a 50 mm, right? So for me, because I want to get used to shooting in 35 millimeters, you would see this number all the time in film, okay? So a good all-rounder lens is 35 millimeters, in my personal opinion, because what you can do is you can, you, you, you have enough field of view to have a wide image. And if it's just too, if it's too wide, you can still go up closer to what you want to take and capture it. Otherwise, if you want a variable focal length, then I would suggest a 24 to 70 lens because that is, that is a lens that can zoom enough and have a wide enough view from the light that's entering. And well, I'm running out of words to say, but yeah. 24 to 70 is also 
the best all rounder lens in my opinion. Okay, because you get a good enough focal length to zoom and zoom out. What is a good composition? <laughs> a good composition is when you have the story in your image being said to the viewer in the most simple way as possible. And so they would understand it simply just by looking at it. You don't have to say anything, just let them take it all. Okay. All right. Sometimes in games, people take amazing pictures like an asphalt. <laughs> yeah, I mean, if you want to, if you want to practice composition, sure, you can use games as your, as your practice. So for example, in open world games, so I'm assuming you're a gamer, Adam. So if you have open world games, like I think GTA, The Witcher 3, or you know, all these cool games, what you can do is you can move your camera around and take screenshots. And in a way you are practicing your composition skill. It's just the more modern way of practicing composition. So it's good, it's a good idea. I like that. <laughs> but yeah, if you wanna practice your composition in games, feel free, it's like a simulation. And consider it as a type of way of gaining inspiration for yourself. So if you like a specific shot you took in the game, try it in real life and you never know. Maybe you'll, that would be your main type of photography. You know? So. It's a good practice too, I like that. Yeah, I like that, I like that. Are you in a relationship, sir? <laughs> That's a, a bit of a crazy question. <laughs> oh, and that is the last question, I love that, bro. <laughs> Jerome. Um, that's a question mark. <laughs> that is a question mark. <laughs> the question mark, man. We'll answer that. <laughs> okay. But thanks, though. <laughs> got me, got me back up again. Uh huh. Okay. Um. Mm. Okay. Among your works, which one is your favorite? I already said that. I already said that over there. That was my cat. The cat was the coolest one. And yeah, I think I already explained why. So yeah, I think we can now officially close the Q and A. Um, if you still want to reach me, my my um, my my. Okay, I'll leave my Instagram in the Zoom chat, but it's just. C Dale Z. If you want to ever send me a DM or you want to reach me and and talk to me, it would be C D A Y L E Z. That would be my Instagram. If you want to talk to me and you want to share some ideas and you want to really reach out, I will be I will be replying most of the time throughout the day. Since I'm always on Instagram, I like looking at inspirations here and there. So so yeah. Once again, guys, thank you so much for spending your time with me and with Phil Sock today. It's been a long day and hopefully um, everyone was able to learn something new. Um, I'm sure we were kind of stretching the limits of our whole session today. And hopefully um, I get to see you all one day when everything is easier. And I would really love to watch you all grow as photographers, as artists, and to really pursue what you want to be doing. It doesn't have to be photography, it could be anything else, but I do believe in each and every one of you. You all are capable of doing wonderful things. And this would be me, Colin Torres, signing off. All right. Thank you so much, everyone. Okay. Thank you very much, Colin, for the wonderful training that you have provided. So let us uh, now, uh, I suggest everybody to open their, uh, mute their uh, audio so we can give a round of applause to uh, our speaker for today. Mr. Colin Dale Sablan Torres. It was great. Thank you. Yeah. Good job. Thank you, thank you. Good job. Okay, so now uh, we have uh, some parts uh, we will uh, we'll now recognize some people who have made these things possible. So.
Okay, so now, uh, you know, uh, in behalf of my uh, fellow board of directors and founding members of the Filipino Social Club, uh, I would like to inform you that you are very lucky to, to have this uh, webinar training. And uh, of course, based from this, from a specialist of photography. So now uh, we would like to recognize our speaker for the two session, Mr. Colin Dale Sablan Torres. Uh, we are giving this certificate of appreciation for his meritoriously service in sharing his knowledge through virtual training to the students, youth, and community members in the United Arab Emirates. The virtual introduction to photography given on September 25 and October 2, 2020 signed by me and the president. So, okay, Mr. Colin, can you? Uh... Yeah, yes, Pa. Okay, so. Uh, we are giving you this uh, certificate in, re in return for your uh, sleepless nights <laughs> and preparation for this uh, <laughs> seminar. Thank, thank you. Thank well, of you course, uh, yeah, yeah, of course, with him, uh, I would like to uh, appreciate, we would like to appreciate also uh, the uh, effort of uh, Mr. Milo Torres uh, in supporting this event. Well, uh, I would like to or ask Mr. Milo to open his video so that they can they can see you. Engineer Milo Torres. Yes, thank you. Okay, so uh, of course uh, we will be also recognizing uh, the uh, schools that have participated in this webinar. Uh, first of all, the Alapia Private Schools. AFPS for their outstanding support and participation in the PILSOC Youth Webinar, the name Virtual Introduction to Photography. And given this day, of course, signed by the speaker, the president, and me. So anybody from the uh, Lapia, can, uh, uh, can somebody receive this certificate? Can Anybody from uh, op, uh, teachers, <laughs> can you please uh, open your video and uh, say something about this appreciation so it will be recorded? Anybody from the students? Thank you for, for an uh, Alafia private school. For okay, thank you very much. <laughs> now, uh, uh, lots of uh, students is coming from uh, this school. We. Are giving uh, the Filipino Social Club is giving the certificate of appreciation to Far Eastern Private School, the PEPS, for their outstanding support and participation in the PILSOC Youth Club webinar uh, in the title Virtual Introduction to Photography, given this day, uh, signed by the webinar speaker, the president, and me. So I would like to request uh, the, uh, I think, Miss uh, Veronica to receive the uh, appreciation. Good, after, good evening, Sir Sir Dante and Sir Eric. In behalf of Madam Maria Teresa Salas Alanzari and uh, her family, we would like to thank you for giving us, our students, to have this kind of uh, webinar. And uh, I hope this is not the first time. We will continue doing this for our for the sake for the sake of our students. Thank you very much for. We really appreciate this. Okay. And of course, uh, it. There are two schools of uh, PEPS. It is PEPS Haluan. So uh, anybody from the PEPS Haluan or also Ms. Veronica? Yes. Yes. <laughs> yes, sir. Actually, I am the activity coordinator of our branch, PEPS Haluan. So in behalf of our OIC principal, Ms. Julianne Convento, we would like to thank you also for inviting our students for this kind of webinar. Thank you very much, sir, and feel so. Okay, this certificate appreciations will be delivered to your school uh, by uh, some communications with our officers from the club. Okay, 
So next one will be the, the new Filipino private school, NFPS. Anybody from the uh, teachers or uh, students who has attended this training, the new Filipino private school? I can see that there are students who have uh, attended the training. Anybody now? Or uh, it is only on the procession one? It's the student on here. I think you can visit the other schools. Okay. So there are a lot of schools in which uh, we have uh, received, but uh, uh, well, we will check in accordance with that and we will be sending all the certificate of appreciation to your school by emails or uh, in, in, by, by uh, personal uh, courier or anything. But uh, we will be sending you these certificates. And of course, uh, uh, there is one from the University of Makati. Uh, anybody from the University of Makati was attended? Can you come and uh, get your certificate now? Okay. Okay, now uh, I would like to uh, call on uh, our Vice President, Mr. Cesar Mora. Can, can Cesar Mora appear now? Can you open your uh, video? Cesar Mora? Sir Dante, how about the certificates for the uh, attendance? Okay, now for the certificate of students, uh, we will be uh, uh, providing you by, uh, because it has, it is a lot about uh, nearly 50 certificates. We will be distributing these things and sending all by emails to the responding uh, participants. So uh, it is, uh, if we will be giving all the 50s, then uh, we will be reaching up to eight o'clock to receive the uh, mm -hmm. certificate. But 100% uh, sure that uh, all these, uh, uh, those who have complied to the uh, questions and answer will have a certificate. And of course, uh, some students who want to have the certificates will be uh, qualifying for the questionnaires that we will be sending. And then we will be providing them their certificates, all their certificates. But we cannot uh, give it all now. Okay. All right. So closing remarks, uh, is Vice Cesar is there. Otherwise, uh, of course, uh, I will be giving my closing remarks and the president. Okay. So first of all, uh, I would like to uh, thank all of you in attending this uh, webinar. Of course, uh, we will be giving you more on the next things, but uh, I would suggest that uh, now you have joined the Filipino Social Club webinars, uh, things, uh, trainings, and I want you to be permanent in these things as a, and join the Filipino Social Club youth. And uh, of course, uh, you are allowed to be member of, of Filipino Social Club and there is some uh, forms to be filled up for membership. And I, I should suppose to the our membership uh, head, which is our vice president, would tell you about it, but uh, we'll see, he is out. So we will be sending the forms to you. There is no charge because you are still uh, youth. So, but uh, of course, we, you need to be a legal member of the Filipino Social Club in order to get this uh, training benefits, not only this type of uh, quality training that we have given you. Of course, uh, thank you very much and uh, see you again for the next webinar. And as I told you, the trainings which you have requested, we will be looking for specialists to conduct this training. And of course, I would like to uh, give the floor to our uh, president to, to give this uh, say something about this webinar. All right, uh, everyone. Again, we are very grateful. And uh, time check, it's already 6.39 uh, and we're always on time, okay? And in behalf of the Filipino Social Club, I would like to thank our uh, officer, uh, Board of Director Engineer Dante Deliso for being the event coordinator. I would like to thank especially to the schools, universities, again, once again, and to all of the students and all of the youths. And uh, it is true that uh, Philosoph Filipino Social Club is, I, I hope you understand that if you are an India, you have an Indian club. If you're a Pakistan, you have a Pakistan club. Filipinos, we have now the Filipino Social Club and we also have for the youth. So this is for all of us, for all of the Filipinos. And again, we are always here to support the schools, the students and the youth. Thank you once again. And I look forward to see all of you. Okay, once the pandemic is over, I'm going to visit your school and we're going to meet 
once again. And we'll all also visit uh, Dubai Expo uh, area. All right. Thank you very much. And uh, good evening. Uh, shout out to all of the students and youth and all of the teachers. Maraming salamat at mabuhay tayong lahat. Okay, now uh, we will have a final uh, uh, picture for those survivors for this training. So, uh, 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 Sir Nilo, can you... Uh... Okay, everyone, say A! <laughs> okay, let me see. All right, I think this is the survivor of a training <laughs> session. So you are very lucky for this training. Okay. All right. Okay, now. Okay. Thank you very much, and see you all for the next uh, training. Thank you to our speaker, Sir Colin. Very cool. Hello, Sir Colin. Thank you, Paul. Thank you, everyone. Thank you. Thank you. Good morning. Good morning. Thank you. 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 Okay, thank you.